I want to call this meeting of the Belton Independent School District Board of Trustees to order a quorum of board members is present. This meeting has been duly called and posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. If you'll join me in the pledge to the American flag. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, <laughs> indivisible, with, with liberty and justice for all. And the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, all of you who are with us also uh, certainly want to welcome Carrie and Janet and Ty, who along with Jason are uh, on the ballot this uh, couple of months away, six weeks away. May 6th. May 6th. May 6th. Um, thank you all for joining us. We are going to begin this evening uh, with a workshop with Jared. <laughs> workshop with Jared on facilities. So. Come on up. Do you have anything? Or we no, just start Jared's right? here. Jared, to, you're the man. Give us some so updates. give us some updates. Let's start off with where are we at with our auto tech facility. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Is your mic on? I have the distinct Thank pleasure you. of uh, giving you an update on the three projects we have on board uh, right now or on the boards right now, which are the Belton CTE, uh, projects, the just, elementary school and high second. school. We have a blank screen over here. Yep. Can you help us? Get it we can see behind Jared, and this one's off. But that one's... Okay, go ahead. We'll catch up. Okay. So, uh, my goal tonight is really to kind of bring the board up to speed of kind of where we're at and kind of what's happening, uh, and then kind of move forward from there and talk about the next steps here as we move forward. Uh, so on the belt and on the CTE construction projects, uh, there are really two projects uh, in within that one. Uh, the first is the automotive technology building, which is the building that's on the south side of Tiger Drive near BHS 9. Uh, and so these are pictures here that you see where they've received the pre-engineered metal building. Uh, they're starting to put the framing on the, the side of the building and starting to get the sheathing on. I would anticipate here in the next uh, couple weeks that they will have the building dried in and start march marching towards their completion date, which is towards the end of May. Uh, and then at that point, the building be turned over the, for the district during the summer, uh, and you'll be able to move in over the summer and then start school come fall uh, with a brand new automotive technology building on there. Uh, so kind of working through the details, ensuring that the uh, contractor's moving forward, getting all the, everything correct, uh, and uh, no, no uh, further challenges here as we go along. No pools, those kind of things. That's it looks good. Is it everything going the way it's supposed to? Everything's going the way it's supposed to. Okay. So no, no big uh, challenges. It's been exciting that. to see it going up. It is. Yeah. Uh, it'll come up quick here. The concrete right? sat there a long time waiting for steel. It, it did. So the, the shop drawings were a little bit of a challenge to get through and get all the fine details correct, but wanted to make sure that uh, we got that pre-engineered building in correctly. Right. right. So. Good. Uh, then the other uh, part, portion of that project is the construction technology building. Uh, so that one intentionally was put ahead of the automotive technology building. So we received the pre-engineered frame uh, and were able to erect and get that project underway basically between Thanksgiving and Christmas and time to turn that back over to the CT department, uh, the construction trades, to be able to start using that. Uh, if you talk to Miss Necessary or her staff, they're extremely excited about that project. They're out there using it today, building buildings uh, and Man, several sure. things that are really key for that program and moving towards uh, hopefully national winners, state winners uh, for that CTE project. So that one's pretty much done at this point. And that one's being heavily used. That's correct. Even at night. They have lights on. Exactly. Out there. They're using it, getting ready for state. State competition exactly. is coming up. Exactly. So Great. That, that's a quick update on the construction side. Hey, good deal. Any questions anybody has on those? Good so, projects for our kids. So the next two projects are the elementary school and the comprehensive high school number two. Uh, these projects are in design uh, as we're moving forward. So I'm going to talk about each one, uh, hit the highlights, because we're going to be coming uh, forward as, as, we, uh, as we come next time. We'll be talking about the forward progress. Uh, so one of the keys is 
these projects are a work in progress. Uh, so the information that you're going to see on here is not intended to be the final plans. Yeah, we're not here to take any action tonight. This is just an update. That's exactly correct. Uh, and we're continuing to meet with district staff. We've had uh, two meetings on each uh, with the project executive groups of four in total. We've met with user group. We've done facility tours. We've gone through the high school, met with CTE. Uh, so all in all, we're continuing the, the same ingrained process with district staff along the way to get the right input uh, for both projects. Uh, so jumping into the elementary school, uh, come the uh, January uh, board meeting, after looking at the options uh, for the various site plans, uh, we landed on the Poison Oak site uh, and really started the design process from there that that allowed us uh, with a site selection, with a goal of making it very similar to the last three elementary schools that Belton built, uh, is really jump into the, the nuances of the site design and the articulation of the building and the floor plan and all those elements here. Uh, so the graphic you see here is really just that summary of the, the pros and cons for that site. Uh, and then you see the Poison Oak site there in red. So then as we got into the actual site design, uh, we really looked at the last three schools that Belton ISD built, which were Tarver, Chisholm Terrell, and High Point Elementary School. And you see those site images there on the left and really started looking at the, the minutia of the, the variations between them. Although that you think they're the same, there are actually several differences between them. Uh, and so we talked about what worked well and what didn't work well between uh, all three projects. And then we started looking from a, what I'll say, more global or regional perspective of how you're approaching the elementary school site. The image there on the right uh, highlights the kind of the Belton ISD area sitting there between the city of Belton, city of Temple, the sites in the, the white box. Uh, and so we're starting to look at how you approach the site, how most of the uh, uh, pedestrians would approach the site or vehicles would come from a more regional perspective to start informing the design process. Uh, so that's really led into looking at some preliminary images uh, for the site design. Uh, here you see some suggestions now of uh, drive and access, how you're addressing uh, building, the existing vegetation, uh, but really then paying respect to uh, natural orientation of the site. Uh, you'll notice there at the northwest of the site, there's a lot of vegetation. So like one of the ideas is we're working towards is trying to integrate that into the playground area. Uh, so that'd be great for the students, but then also it's a great buffer to some of those existing homeowners. Uh, so we're adding in those layers of information and detail uh, from beginning to end on the elementary school site. Uh, we're going through that same process. So on the floor plan design, so this, the image on the left is the, the program, uh, kind of the grocery list for the elementary school building. Uh, and on the right is the existing elementary school floor plan. And so we really, again, went through the, the detailed study about, you know, why certain decisions were made previously, are those the right decisions now? And what is it that we want to change and modify as we move forward? And so we're starting to look at a uh, slightly updated floor plan. You'll see that overall the, the shape and the orientation is very similar in design, uh, but there's some key strategies that we're trying to implement that will really help uh, facilitate the educational delivery within the elementary school uh, there. Uh, then from the floor plan design, we're starting to look at the exterior design as well. Uh, very same process as let's look at the three existing elementary schools. Let's talk about uh, what kind of architecture that we represent. Uh, so here in the coming weeks, we're gonna be presenting some content to the district administration and, and the staff to be able to really review those design opportunities, present some options uh, and move forward. Uh, so come here in April, uh, so in one month, we'll be bringing back a schematic design set of drawings uh, for the board to review. Uh, so that I'll know, not only we'll go into depth about the information I presented today, uh, but talk a lot about the MEP system, civil structural systems as well. Uh, that'll be a comprehensive package for the elementary school to move forward with in design. So that's the elementary school. Okay, no, I'm wait, I, I've got a question. Yep. Um, and, and may go back to the site plan. One of the most common questions we get, and you know, we lost, all lost it. it all now. Okay. Um, most common questions we get is traffic control and all on, on that site and how it's going to be laid out. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about what your thinking is in terms of buses and staff and sure. parents and multiple access and, and just where Poison Oak is and yep. in terms of, of that site planning? Uh, so right right now, uh, the bottom line on the drawing that kind of goes left to right, uh, which would be this one okay. right here, uh, and on... We're having a little bit of yeah. technology problems. Our screen isn't working here, so we're working off of iPads and, and that screen. So, and But y'all can see that one, and that's good. So This road right here there you go. Okay. is Poison Oak. <clears throat> Uh, and so that would be the main access into the site. And a lot of uh, the general thought is right now is that when you look at a regional perspective, uh, that would be where most of the students would probably come from uh, if they're not coming from the adjacent neighborhoods. Which a large number will. Yes, yes, so. exactly. Uh, and as well as Temporal is currently planning, looking at when they could improve Poison Oak Road. Uh, so we're starting those discussions and starting to look at then the greater impact about signals and lights and pedestrian <laughs> traffic along the way. Uh, but in general, the thought was is that we'd like to keep the majority of the traffic out of the neighborhood if possible uh, from a parent drop off and a bus traffic drop off. So you'll note that uh, there are two entrances off of Poison Oak Road. The leftmost entrance would handle parents. So you would come in that site, loop through the front. It'd be very similar to Chisholm Trail where you'd have the three queuing depth for pickup in the afternoon. And you'd loop back out and you'd come out of that Poison Oak Road exit as well. Uh, you'll notice there is a connection then into the neighborhood off of that, as well as in a road going to the north that loops. Right, Those so, are, so it looks, on this planning, it looks like you could actually access that there's really three entrances to that parking lot i well four maybe if you count them all but the main entrance you're thinking poison oak but there's that side entrance if you're coming off the neighborhood correct and so the preliminary discussions that we would provide some traffic control gates to be able to limit control right. but the opportunity would be is thanksgiving lunch you've got a play that you may need as many exits as possible so you have the opportunity to open those as needed. Okay. So, but the, so the conversation was that the day-to-day -day routine traffic um, arrival and dismissal of the new elementary school would occur from Poison Oak Road. Those other two entrances would be gated <coughs> okay. and used for emergencies or special events as needed, but the, the bulk okay. of the business of the school would occur. So it from. would still, so if you wanted to get back into Carriage House, you could still come back out on Poison Oak yes. and back in? Yes, because you couldn't, as you're, you have cars coming in and going to the right around the car loop, you can see where that little red triangle is, that's the mm -hmm. front door of the school. And so parents are dropping off as they go through and then they're coming back out. And so our discussion was, is that we wouldn't want them going into the neighborhood as they were leaving because that would create a bottleneck there. So the, that, those were, those two sections that open up there would be gated um, and used as needed for emergencies Lar larger or capacity the two times a year that we have open house events right, and we need, kind of we have more people mm -hmm. there all at once, but predominantly the, the um, traffic for that school would be through Poison Oak. Okay. And so, so this one on the right, the eastern side, that would be bus? That's the bus lane. So that would be the, the bus lane. They would run up. You'd have a teacher and staff parking there along the right side and loop around then and support the buses very similar to you're doing at your current schools as well. And that goes all the way back out then? Uh, the thought would be is you'd loop and come back out to Poison Oak Road again from a day-to-day -day basis. And that access road around the back as well as the little kidney bean shaped road, those are really intended for fire access, is that we will need to have all points of the building within, it's a 300 feet uh, of that road. So that's really what we're working towards uh, on that side. But again, that's a lot of road back there for no use. Well, it, you either have to do a loop or a hammerhead, so it, it generally okay, so works really out about the same. The same. Yeah. Okay. So would you show them the path of the buses? It's exactly the same as what we're doing at Chisholm Trail Elementary and as well as um, High Point this Elementary. This would look a lot like Chisholm Trail and... Yes. So Not right High Point, point excuse no, me. No, no, um, this way, go through the, the parking area, loop around, and then back through and then out. Mm -hmm. And then the front with, for the parents. So they would have to turn right out of there. Mm -hmm. And then the front, the parents would come this route and turn, loop around, 
and then come back out from there. And a lot of the thought is kind of like you indicated, Randy, is uh, there would hopefully be a lot of students who would be riding their bikes or pedestrians. And so the thought was as much as so we can manage that. A lot of that, kids live in that neighborhood and ride around there. So as much as we can manage the traffic exactly. In that neighborhood actually by putting the school there. The goal was uh, vehicles are generally at the southeast of the site, which really frees up the northwest of the site. So we've talked about bike trails and uh, pedestrian access. Exactly. So, so students would be able to, from the neighborhood, access the school from other other angles. Correct. So, for example, we've, we're starting to show a, a walk path or a bike path here. Uh, and then when, as we go around, we're going to look at other opportunities that border the site. Is there a way that working with the developers, if they have a, a sidewalk planned or something like that, can we allow them okay. to get into the site? Is there a reason we're not connecting the street, uh, the middle street that you've left? I guess just a trail coming off of why it's not connecting back in and using traffic gates to go ahead and build that. I mean, that's not that far of a distance. We, we definitely can. Uh, and so that would be an option instead of doing the kind of kidney bean loop, we connect, connect out there. Uh, some of the discussions were is that those are existing homeowners. So as much as we can minimize connections, the better, uh, as well as balancing more connections, more road is more money. I understand the complaints that the homeowners have had out there, but I think a bigger worry that I have is safety on Poison Oak, especially in the first year to two years when that road hasn't been rebuilt yet. Uh, getting a better number, and I'm sure we have a number of how many cars normally stack up, waiting for school to be let out to make sure that stack up doesn't go out onto Poison Oak. Um, in this case, you know, flipping it may work better as the bus loop of make you would for sure know you had enough room for cars to stack on the property versus being Poison Oak. Because Poison Oak's only about 20 foot wide right now yep. with no curbs. Um, it, so. And that's something we're, we're definitely looking at right now. You can queue about 60 cars on site. Uh, and so we're using Chisholm Trail as that model in terms of the number of cars you can queue on site. Uh, because both City of Temple and Belton have had voiced some complaints to the about queuing length and where you should turn in and how you should approach the school or, site. Of course, again, there, there are a whole lot more students who live right around that site than live at Chisholm Trail site I mean, mm -hmm. within walking. There are some, but not near the volume that that one will have. So let hopefully there will be just, fewer, but, yeah, but it's me, a valid issue. Let me just add another um, reason that that, was, that road was not connected there was the um, we'd like to have bike riders and walkers come in through that section and that loop there that you see in the center will be focused around playground area and used we, uh, similar to what we have at Chisholm Trail mm -hmm. Elementary. If you've driven around to the back, we have basketball goals around that paved fire, that I believe it's a fire uh, yes. loop. Yeah. And, but it works nicely for kids playing and it's blocked off from traffic during the day. Um, but for the, in this case, the idea was to, to get our bikes through there and not have car traffic through there too. And we have a lot of bike riders at, yeah. at High Point Elementary, which would be very similar in terms of houses connected right to the school. And so we wanted to take care of the kids coming through that, that area. Yeah. Well, we need to look to the north there. If you'll look at uh, Salt Mill Hollow, the intersection that you show at the very top right mm -hmm. of, uh, I think that's uh, wagon wheel that comes into Salt Mill Hollow. At the end of that street, mm -hmm. there's already a six foot uh, trail built to the school site, dead ends at that site. And that's um, great. That's already but, there. That would good. be better for uh, bike traffic from that area versus coming off the main road to the west. Does that go all the way? It's already there, Jason? It's already there. Hmm. We'll take a look at that. So That's good. Again, accommodating hike and bike trails is great and important. We saw, we've seen that at High Point, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. Okay, work in progress. Yep, understand. We'll continue, we'll continue to add layers of decision all, along the way. Uh, you know, from from connections, making sure that we've got the pedestrian, any hike and bike trails in the area, <coughs> things as we move forward. Well, just to add that we can all remember North Belton Middle School when it opened for that first year, when we had to use Prairie View, and we stacked a hundred cars out in front of it, and people trying to get by. The street actually shut down. Mm -hmm. for an hour yeah, I, during the day. One of the there interesting no things, that as a, and I've heard 
like you, a lot of the questions about that. How are we going to do that? One of the interesting things that's different is we moved Belt Middle School to North Belt Middle School, so it opened full, basically. Mm -hmm. This school is not going to open full, and so it won't have 800 students in it yes, softer. the first mm -hmm. year. So, so we'll have some ramp-up time, so that will help, obviously, in the as we're waiting on the roads to catch up. But clearly, traffic control is a primary concern um, for our community and needs to stay at the forefront of all of our decisions. So, so I, th I'm glad to know that trail's up there on the north side. That's helpful, too. And good thing our councilman for that area is very aware of that road as well since he lives down the street from it. So. He's a neighbor, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, that helps. <laughs> Be extra parking in his driveway for events? Is that... I'm kidding. Okay. Any other questions on the elementary? Okay. Thank you. So then uh, high school two, the comprehensive high school. I, I, I just want to make sure that we mentioned that the we had teachers and administrators from um, High Point Elementary and Chisholm Trail Elementary at the table as we had discussions about the floor plan and, and, and the site plan and things that worked and didn't work Good. that we could do better. So, um, and Tarver. And Tarver. And we're very excited about the the tweaks they're tweaks. good I'm interested to see what those tweaks are we we've mm -hmm. uh, as it develops and the goal is uh next time we'll go Very into minimal. a little bit more in depth uh to some of those changes in the system support uh, so comprehensive high school number two uh so i want to kind of rewind uh just a little bit and touch base on that Right now, we were we decided on option B uh, in terms of the program square footage, which was a 2,500 student high school core and classroom, uh, and 385,000 square feet. Uh, and so, as we move forward, that was really our, our goal moving forward. That that's that's the uh, the bucket that we have to to design and uh, look at from a, that perspective. Uh, and so we started again very similarly. We, we've met with a lot of uh, user groups uh, and administration. We've had uh, both high school principals on site with us or at the meetings with us and really started diving into that program and, and looking at the minutia and starting to get into the floor plan design. In general, the, the high school's trailing the elementary school a little bit, just it's a, it's a bigger project, but bigger uh, space, takes a little bit more time. Uh, but we really started then on the site uh, and looking at the imagery here and, and starting to look at the forms and the natural things that start informing that site plan. The image you see here on screen is a picture from High Point Elementary School looking towards the northwest. Uh, and so here this was really starting for uh, the opportunity for us to start looking at uh, the natural topography on the, the site, uh, how it actually slopes up towards uh, 2483. Uh, start looking at the, the north southeast directions where the high school wants to sit uh, and look at those different opportunities there. Uh, and last time, uh, with, as we met with the board, the images there, the image you see on the left is one of the what I'd call test fits uh, that we originally did with the board. It is uh, what, will it fit on the site? What are the, the things that will happen there? Uh, and how do we move forward? And now we're continuing to evolve that design. And you see there are two images there on the right. Uh, and those are really just the, the graphics that we're starting to look at to start understanding uh, the field locations, the orientations, what are the opportunities and the interactions that the uh, academic side may have with the athletic side of the site. Uh, where's the front door to the building? You know, answering some of those basic questions and even getting down to access and. You know, here you'll have, uh, we're planning for about a thousand parking stalls on site. So there's like 600 students that have to come in and out of the site every single day. So how are we getting them in and out? And looking at all of those levels uh, of detail here as we move forward, uh, these are not ready to go into depth uh, over there, can ask some, answer some general questions. Uh, but we also have met with the High Point principal and talked then about you know, how she's dealing with access day to day, how that might interact with the, the high school uh, you know, and, and all those different things there. From that discussion, that 
that starting to lead to what the building uh, starts look, looking like in terms of floor plan. So here we call these macro organizational concepts about, you know, basically where's the athletics going to be in the building, the, you know, how's that adjacent to the auditorium, uh, where might then the uh, core learning environments be, uh, be located at, as well as then getting into the minutia of, well, is CTE a, a, a different corridor, very similar to it is on Belton High School, or do you start integrating CTE throughout the building and kind of putting education on display so as students walk down the hall, they say, hey, that looks cool. I'm gonna, I want to go do construction technology, or I want to go do food uh, culinary. Uh, those type of things, uh, and really start understanding how the parts and <coughs> pieces come together as a whole within the design of the floor plan. Uh, and then even taking it to the next level, the four images you see there on the right are just kind of blow up images of what the core learning environments might look like. And so as we talk about some of the strategies uh, about pushing and pulling out of the classroom and creating collaborative space, uh, as well as uh, distributed dining, how those begin to work in the environment to really have that discussion with the district about how that uh, works best, uh, not only in terms of for the student and the educational process, but how does the district maintain and use those spaces along the way. So I, I will pause here. So that, that's the, the progress in general on the high school. We're continuing to have discussions on that one and evolve. Uh, that one will bring schematic design to the board for approval in May uh, for, that, for that, this project. Okay. So I'm kind of curious, what, what's the thinking about what goes where? I mean, how? What, what's the conclusions? You mentioned those are the questions being asked. What's our conclusions? Uh, there's a lot. Everything needs to be close to everything else. Is kind of what I sure. I uh, th there's a lot of different conclu conclusions. A lot of uh, about uh, maybe in how you think about it. So, for example, some of the things we talked about in uh, concept A, the yellow box is the library. Well, in concept B, the yellow box was on the second floor, you know, and the idea was you have a library that overlooks the, the dining area and kind of becomes a destination. Well, the, the goal, the uh, staff really liked the library being on the first floor, but centrally located. And how do you create that as a dining space, a flexible space outside of the library that then turns into the core learning areas? And so you see a lot of that coming together in the, uh, the concept A. Uh, and then in concept B, we really explored uh, how CTE is, is ingrained in the concept you see there, you have four core learning environments, which are the blue, uh, but the, the science is the large block left of those. Uh, so science would be located here. Uh, and then we located CTE in its own hallway destination there at the end. And, and the idea is, well, then CTE can really generate ideas and work together as a group. Uh, but in the end, uh, it was actually thought of it's better to have them dispersed and kind of located ideal to their uh, each department, which you see again in A, uh, that CTEs kind of dropped into those different buckets and there's some on the second floor as well. And it's that opportunity that all, get, all kids can engage uh, on CTE. Uh, so there were actually lots of conversation that we can go through 10, 20 points uh, about those details, but that's just a snippet into the conversations we've had. It's early. <laughs> yeah, it is early, very early on this one. Uh, so then it, on the two projects, so right now uh, we were talking April and May for schematic design for the elementary school and high school respectively. Uh, we're still targeting uh, being complete with the projects in January and April of 2018. Uh, that would give you basically 15 months for the elementary school to build and ab about 27 to 30 months for the high school uh, construction to move forward for the 2019 and 2020 openings, again, respectively, for the elementary school and the high school. And again, next steps are, are we're continuing to work with the district on, on both projects, going through those in detail. Uh, we've met with maintenance staff, toured the schools, continue to meet with the administration and, and the elementary school and high school staff. And so our next two big ones are the April and May milestones for those. That's, in short, my presentation. Quick update of where we're at and would welcome any additional questions. Any questions about high school process? 
design process? Again, again, I know you're getting lots of input from lots of folks who have lots of ideas, good ideas. So making all those go together is the challenge, right? That is that is like, what we do every. How does everything get next to everything else? Exactly. It, it, which is. Uh, if you go, if you go back to the uh, <coughs> site concepts, one of the things that you'll um, see that that we asked um, architects to consider was how to keep the student parking um, separated from the elementary school. And so you'll see that the, the the parking for students in that first drawing there is um, is the most northern on the more, most northern piece of that property, um, and so student traffic would not be in, integrated in any way with elementary students traffic or students who are walking from one campus to the to the other, which is the case um, with current situation at Belton High School. So that was a priority for us. Um, and then we, you know, looked at the orientation of the fields and um, how the fields um, connect to the to the building. And um, one of the things that is important to the high school staff is that students who are moving throughout the day to athletics, um, that 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 it that we have greater supervision and are able to move them sure. um, more easily. So and again, having having things closer together instead Correct. of across, and you have to right. travel yeah. long distances. And, and, it, and it's, it's efficiency. And it's better for the students right. because the students Safety. have a limited amount of time to travel between Absolutely. classes too. So um, that's, and that doesn't even count on those rare days that it does rain, but it does Correct. rain occasionally, yes. which creates some problems. Yes. But, so but really, just those are things we're trying to, to improve with the site plan. As well as then also looking at what I consider a master plan of, you know, talking about what happens in 25 years and you need to do building additions or you want to add this, where could those right. go on site, mm -hmm. right. starting to create some spaces for those, even though we don't know what they are. So I know it's it's too early, but one of the questions I'm really interested in is where we're going to have a band practice area because right now that's a, it's a difficult to get from the band hall to where they practice. You have to go through the, and around and about, and I'm, I'm hoping that in our site planning, those kind of things that um, are planned so that it's easier for just moving equipment. Absolutely. Yes. And, uh, not, not only that, then where do you back the truck up to load the band right. equipment? All and that, that kind those of Those are all the level of details, and so as the two of these start coming together uh, and more definition is given on the floor plan and we get the adjacencies more and more honed in, then it balances with the site plan to be able to start solving those issues. We know that they need to be addressed uh, as we move forward, but we're definitely thinking about that and where the band marching field is, how are we sectioning it off, painting and striping it, all those things. So the other one, in that same area, rain is you talk about CTE being either clustered together or spread out throughout. <laughs> That's the program that has people from outside coming in a lot. Right. Um, do they need to still go through the main office? Is there other access points for, um, you know, folks who are, I mean, how do you, and there, that's a weighing the pros and cons of both ways, I know, but mm -hmm. what's the, what's our thinking about that at this point? So, for example, in both of these schemes, uh, and I'll take the, the top scheme here, for example, is potentially the idea was that this would be a CTE entrance, and right. this would be a parking lot that is uh, predominantly used for game day, uh, but then could be used as the CTE parking lot. So if you're a vendor, you could come in and literally walk right in the building, CTE is right there. I mean, it'd still be a controlled access point, which we need. Have to have that. But um, so there may be a pathway through the school if, if you're a... And so that, that's where we talked about uh, what we called the, this scheme on the top is the main street, uh, you know, and it, it is that main street that bridges all things uh, across uh, athletics to academics to uh, cafeteria, that that would be a clear path of travel that you may come in that far right end and there's an office there to check you in and a remote administration, okay. uh, but it's easily guidable that somebody could either take you there or that you know, that, that the identification or the wayfinding within the building is very easy to get around. Sure. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, you know, at any high school, obviously, but certainly at Belton High School, we have things going on at night or different times in different parts of the building. And so access points uh, it is important. You yep. Know, parking <clears throat> and then access points. Yep. And so that's, again, uh, in, in both of these schemes, that's why the gymnasium and the auditorium lean towards that west side. They're close to the athletics. They're close to the student parking. You have an event entry. We'll start getting into 
Where do you put your doors to be able to segregate those off from the rest of the building? All those layers of detail will come in. Great. And, and just to clarify, in, in all the thinking at this point, it's a two-story building. Like, right. yes. and, and that's what we've done in our middle, past two middle schools. And so that, that's efficient. Correct. Right. That, that's the, the planning at this yes. point. Yes, thank, thank you for reminding me. Yes, uh, so right now the, the majority of the high school is single story. Where you see the blue and the kind of teal colors, that's where you start introducing the second story that, you know, that allow uh, some flexibility separation. on the site and separation. So whether you do a departmental or grade level based organization that you have that opportunity to create differences. Um, one of the things that we saw at um, Westwood High School and uh, Leander's Tom Glenn High School was the use of the library um, as a hub for the students and to really set the tone for the culture of the campus. And so we've um, made that library in this drawing the kind of the hub so that kids have a place to go and there's some soft seating and that it's um, used throughout the day more frequently. Um, and then the other thing that we um, saw in Tulsa Union was some distributed dining and I know Jared touched on that a little bit but, but what we've incorporated here is um, a smaller cafeteria size than what you would see um, at a Belton High School and, and those learning communities use that same square footage to shift over to those learning communities where we would also have um, some smaller service areas for students so that they have a smaller area to have lunch and you start breaking down the, the big size of that cafeteria and students have other places to be. So we envision students being able to um, dine in those learning communities on the bottom floor, in the cafeteria, perhaps in the, in the open seating in the library, um, and even perhaps in that CTE culinary arts space if we can open that up into that hallway and so that, the, that we can supervise along that main street as you called it but have some options for students that begins to feel smaller at that larger school. One of the major themes that we've had is really helping spaces, what I'll say is work hard, that they're serving multiple duties, that you know, it's a cafeteria, it's collaboration space, it's meeting space, uh, and that's the case all the way throughout the building from, from culinary to the classrooms to the, the cafeteria. Oh, Randy mentioned one thing that was difficult uh, ban, for example, to getting around the current high school. There's a lot of other examples of bad situations, difficult to get around uh, the current high school because time was built and everything being added on and overcrowded and all those things. But uh, I know staff has had input so far with some part of the design concept. Have we done a student survey? Uh, because you may have some different ideas from the students that they find very difficult in their travel pass. Have we done a survey? with them to get some of their input on what they find difficult moving through the area. building we have not but i think that's a great idea we could bring a group of students in to look yeah. at this plan and talk about it with us or have actually have idea. some join yep. us on our project it's executive idea. Have committee some student so focus it's a fantastic groups. Idea. it'd be easy to yep. when you move their ipad just a, yeah something that could be done very easily because some of the areas that I hear complaints from some of the students or some of our newer add-on spots are causing difficulties as well um, that are, even though they're recently built, they're still overcrowded and they're difficult to move around and they just didn't quite lay out as well as they should have. Mm -hmm. I'll bring up one with our multi-purpose facility, the field house, uh, a big complaint there was a lot of those athletes with those the showering, dressing rooms, even though it's built, it's very tight and very difficult, hard for them to get in there and shower, especially with the athletics first period and get to that second period class. Yeah, the, the distance yeah, between the facility way. and the campus, which is why you see on this site plan, um, two options that pull the, that field in closer to the facility um, with that, that first one being um, one that we really like um, and two is, another, is the other one that we like. So we, we considered several <coughs> and gave you the two that we, um, we thought did that the best and that, that was one of the main points of our discussion was those students that have to travel and my daughter's one of those she's had to do make that and i understand how far that is and another one it delays them quite a bit and i know it's a newer, newer building but making sure since 
athletics is during the day and not at the end of the day, that we have enough showering facilities that they can get in and get time because a lot of those athletes are not getting, they're not taking care of their bodies in time because they're worried about being late. Yeah. It's just something that thinking about earlier in the day because it's at the end of the day, you don't have as many that are showering there, they just leave. But being early in the day, all of them are pretty much having to do that mm -hmm. before you. Yeah, so time, time is a factor. Hopefully, Hopefully they're doing that. Okay. Which, which, again, goes back to that same point. We need everything closer to each other, to everything else. And so how do you, but, but we have a wide open field there where we can do that. Yep. And, and that's part of master planning a site. And I think that student survey plan. would be important because some of them, they're not, they may not staff or make but some of that for just from the students finding their difficulties that they see may be a little different than how staff use it we, maybe a focus group with some yep. students would it, be it, exactly really, in addition really or, or certainly mm -hmm. part of that we uh, got a lot of great input from our students in our previous planning process to get to the point to the we needed to do this so that makes sense good it's a great good idea. suggestion mm -hmm. um, what else anybody else have any questions Here. appreciate your work look forward to the continuing development and as you figure out how to make all those things work and the puzzle pieces fit together and and uh, on, on all of those projects so it's the funnest part so I yeah, yeah. enjoy it and enjoy working with Belton great. and appreciate the opportunity great it's thanks exciting. okay I'm going to um, make a suggestion we uh, we want to delay our recognitions until six o'clock um, because some of our folks, we told them to, that was when we would recognize, so we want to do that. But um, if there's no uh, disagreement, let's do the consent agenda so we can get that out of the way, and then we'll take a break. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any item on the consent agenda you'd like pulled for discussion? Okay, let me identify those items. We have the minutes of the February 27th, 2017 regular meeting, the unaudited financial report for the month ending February 28th, 2017. Gifts, grants, and bequests of less than a thousand. That's a report only uh, on page 54. Uh, the packet. We have other revenues of at least a thousand less, but less than ten thousand. Um, we have two of those. The Magic Bells Booster Club donated seven thousand dollars to assist with costs to attend nationals, and High Point Elementary PTA donated two thousand one hundred dollars to assist with costs for field trips. We have the Instructional Materials Allotment Antique Certification for 2017-18. This is an annual certification that we're required to do. We have the new course request for 2017-18, and this is four additional dual credit courses at UMHB. We're very appreciative of UMHB uh, offering those. I think we're gonna talk more about that. Deanna is gonna talk to us a little bit more about that at a later agenda item, but we wanna approve those items. Um, and then we have the uh, TASB Media Honor Roll nominations. Whoops, excuse me. Hang on, no, no, shoot. Sorry about that. I'll get there in just a second. I want to make sure I get them all correctly. Uh, it's our recommendation that we nominate for the Texas Association of School Boards Media Honor Roll to recognize members of the press. Uh, for their efforts in helping us uh, communicate with our public. Uh, Tony Adams, sports editor for the Belton Journal. Uh, Kira Pixler, news editor for the Belton Journal. Stephen Adams, reporter for KCN TV. Sydney Hernandez, <laughs> multimedia, multimedia journalist for KWTX Fox 44. Sam DeLeon, reporter for KWTX TV News 10. Uh, Brooke Bednars, reporter for KXXB News Channel 25, and Mario Williams, education recorder, reporter for the Temple Daily Telegram. Uh, and we will, pending approval, submit that to uh, TASB for consideration. Uh, we also have the extension of interlocal agreement with K Colleen ISD for graduation image magnification. We do that each year for graduation services. And then we have the contracts with the Connell Robertson Architects for Architectural Services for the Wall Street Auditorium Upgrades and Lakewood Elementary Music Classrooms and Gymnasium Edition, as we have previously talked about, uh, that follow-up. We have the interlocal agreement with the Education Service Center Region 12 for cybersecurity analysis. Uh, this is Education Service Center through Sentinel Cyber Intelligence, LLC. We have the school bus lease resolution and declaration of official intent. If you recall, last month we approved the lease purchase of two regular 
77 passenger buses and 184 passenger bus. Uh, that was at our February meeting. Uh, so at the total cost of $317,588, so that would be financed at a proposed interest rate for the lease of approximately 2.998 percentage with five annual payments of $68,171.05. Uh, the buses will be scheduled to arrive this summer. First payment on the lease will be made September 15th in 2017, which will be in next year's budget. So again, we're building uh, uh, elements for our budget. Uh, this is as we have done. So the recommendation is to approve the resolution and declaration of official intent of the non-bank qualified lease purchase for vehicles listed. Um, and then we have, uh, make sure I don't skip anything, uh, to approve the competitive sealed proposals as the construction delivery method for Chisholm Trail roofing project and authorize the superintendent to issue a request for proposals for the project, select a committee to evaluate and rank the proposals and bring the recommendation rankings back to the board for approval. Uh, might just mention this was needed due to hail damage received last year you might want to check based on last night to see if we have some more. So it is an insurance claim uh, and insurance will pay for that, but we need to uh, do what we have been doing in the past. That is the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve? I have a motion from Ms. Jordan, second from Mr. Cowan. All in favor of the motion, raise a hand. That passes unanimously. We will take a break at this point and reconvene at six or as soon as we can get everybody in. We have a large number of students to recognize, and so we're going to enjoy that uh, as soon as we can get them in here and start recognizing them. And we'll just ask everybody to kind of work with us on this. We obviously have far too small of a room to recognize the number of students that, that are deserving of recognition tonight. And that is a great problem. So we're gonna do it in shifts and, or waves, however you wanna say it. So here's some instructions. Parents, take pictures, come on up to the front. We'll pause and pose as long as you want. We'll be taking pictures for our website to post up, but we want you to do that too. And your students want you to do that. Even if they tell you they don't, they really want you to. Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna do is bring them up in groups. Um, and I think what was, so, so the first group we're gonna recognize is our Business Professionals of America State Qualifiers. So what I'd like to ask you students and sponsors to do is come on up to the front Okay, as, as you get all up here, then we're going to distribute, we're gonna distribute some certificates and Mr. Carruthers, I believe has a certificate for each of you. If y'all would stand up here. After we get, <coughs> excuse me, after we get those distributed, um, then we're gonna have Mr. DeBeer is going to tell us about you, but we wanna do some logistics and then we'll kind of shift groups because we have a long hallway of groups. Uh, and this will be fun. So this will be a little bit of a crowd management night, but it's a great night to recognize some outstanding students <laughs> who are doing outstanding. We would may be going out of order a little bit just to adjust for people who are, are here or not here yet, and we want to make sure we have everybody here. So do we get everybody? Oh, we're missing one. Wet. We'll get it to you. Help us. Aaron. Okay. So we have an outstanding group of students who qualified to compete at the State Business Professionals of America Leadership Conference at the beginning of this month in Dallas. Um, I want to start by introducing you to the students who qualified for State, and then I'll tell you about a, a couple of uh, students who won special awards as well. Uh, Bailey Peacock qualified in fundamental desktop publishing. Destiny Winkler in business, law, and ethics. Lizzie Nix, Aaron McGoldrick, and Destiny Winkler and Soraya Winkler in administrative support team. And Caden Nutley, Lauren Blair, Erica Agron, and Ethan Evelyn in finan in the fi as a financial analyst team. And then out of the group going to state for BPA, uh, Austin Huffling won the Statesman Torch Award, which is um, an award that really is designed to highlight professionalism and leadership in the activity and in the competition. And incredibly exciting, Caden LA placed fifth in accounting mathematics concepts and second in payroll accounting, advancing to the National Leadership Conference for the second year in a row. Awesome. <laughs> I 
And our advisors for the Business Professionals of America group are Amanda Simpson and Brittany Truitt. We are, pr we are proud of you. Great job, great work. Had a way to represent. Thank you. Good job, guys. All right, you got one more big task ahead, right? Great job. Okay, our next group that we'll try to um, shift, and again, we'll have them all come up, will be our History Fair State Qualifiers. So, if we can have all of our History Fair State Qualifiers come up to the front. Ms. Jordan will um, yeah. distribute. Come on up here. Come on up to the front. All the way up. And Ms. Jordan's going to help uh, or get you a certificate, and then we'll just have you hold here. And when we get everybody up, then we'll have Mr. DeBeer talk about you a little bit. Awesome. All right. Go ahead and go ahead and give them their certificates. If y'all were in. History Fair State Qualifiers. You may have to get them in groups. We, should, we could do the, you might might be helpful to them getting them to you if we had the high school, Belton High School together, the New Tech together, South Belton together, North Belton together. Y'all could cluster together, that would help them. <laughs> okay, keep them coming. Then we'll talk about them in a little bit. Go ahead and get get uh, certificates handed out, and then we'll. I can't even begin to see what's happening. Project this year on the greens. Taryn keeps calling us. <laughs> but uh, he told her, it's like, Taryn, we work too much. I mean, he's just. There you go, keep coming in. Season's just now starting. So. True. Yeah, but I can't convince him to quit working so he can go play golf more. <laughs> See, I told him, I said, I need you back part time, and then you can pick up your golf game again. Yeah. And he's like, not falling for it. Why? Huh. What's wrong with him? He wants to keep working. Yeah, he's good golf too. I know. I keep thinking he can maybe play like in the senior tour one day. He's kept it up. He says it's because he lost all that weight. So he says he can't play as well. You know, most school districts don't get to recognize this. Well, I can see where the wood change. It changed the swing. Mm -hmm. These are state history fair qualifiers. That's a lot. Heather Westbrook. Amanda. Hey, there you go. Autumn. No, geez. Oh, oh, oh. Who are we missing? Did we get everybody? South, but it's on our choir. Region, all region, all region. Those are our choir. This is South Belton. South Belton. Okay. Yes, we want sponsors with your students. But yeah. <laughs> sponsors, come on up and be behind or around your students, but not standing in front of them. Okay. Stand in front of you. Oh, okay. It'll be okay. You think we can convince Randy to do it this way? <laughs> yeah. Follow up as a group, and then yeah. we'll hand them out while. <laughs> trying to see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Well, like Jeff was saying, we get. Uh, 
Kyle gets ahead of us. Yeah, and we're all and trying to we're, hand them out. We don't know who okay. all of them are. Let's talk about these young people and see what great things they have accomplished. The Heart of Texas Regional History Fair was held late last month at Baylor University, and that's where these students either qualified for state or won some other special awards that we're going to celebrate tonight. The State History Fair qualifiers from Belton High School were Emily Gaw, Serena Shador, Antoinette Lynn, and Maddie Finley. And their coordinator is Pamela Rodriguez. The The state qualifiers from New Tech are Ethan Rodarte, Bella Rose Mortel, Sarah Batson, Logan Riggins, Delaney McClanahan, Matt Bean, Heather Westberg, Raina Gonzalez, and Cheyenne Eason, and Staten Thompson. New Tech also had students who won the Daughters of the Texas Republic Award and the Daughters of the American Revolution Award, uh, the former going to Zach Hammer and the latter going to the team of Amanda DeVirgilis, Samantha Ogden, Nia Williams, Jenna Dixon, and Autumn Bethel. Timothy Potts and Matthew Mistrelli are the sponsors for New Tech. We have two teams headed to state from South Belton Middle School. The uh, teams are McKenna Morrow, Celeste Jones, and Serena Yolostalo. Uh, we also have the team of uh, Maheshwari Rajesh, Krithika Rajesh, and Kara Shin, I apologize if I mispronounce some names, who um, won a third place for their group website, and, or I'm sorry, I skipped ahead a little bit, who placed first and also won a special cash award from um, the Waco Chamber for their group exhibit, and Danielle Connors, the sponsor from South Belton Middle School. And then North Belton Middle School has seven students who advanced to state. And um, that also, Hannah Loniker won the Baylor Law School Award for her individual exhibit. The team of Ryan Carpio Brown, Benjamin Broom, Kylan Menapis, and Jack Rahm are headed to state for their group website. Maya Richardson and Emily Muslovsky for their group documentary. And Elizabeth Housen is the coordinator at North Belton Middle School. Okay, really big group. Y'all can stand up on that riser. Let's scrunch you in a little bit so we can get you in one big picture. These students will be representing Belton ISD at the State History Fair. <laughs> that is an exit. Are you having trouble with the Wi Fi? All right, parents, take all the pictures you want. They will smile as long as you want to take pictures. Thank you. Sis can't connect to the network. Were you on? Yeah. Try closing out. Okay. Hey, how are we doing? Congratulations, all. There's some more certificates over there. We'll go check those. <laughs> Great job. Okay, we should have divided those up by school. Sorry about that. Hey, you know. Sorry. That was wonderful. While we're resetting um, and bringing in some all area choir students, as they leave and do that. We'd like to back up and do the Francis Hesselbein Student Leadership Program special recognition.
this is uh, really exciting because it's a national recognition and it's a recognition that went to just 12 students nationwide. Uh, America McCoy was selected to attend the Francis Hesselbein Student Leadership Program at the United States Air Force Academy earlier this month. There are uh, literally hundreds of student to student, student members who apply for this program and through a competitive process that list is, na is narrowed to just 12 folks. 12 in the entire country. World, I'm sorry. I'm too much. <laughs> Universe. All that is known. <laughs> One of 12 representing Belton. Awesome. We're so proud of you. What a great opportunity. You want to tell us a little bit about it? Um, sure. Uh, so it was held mostly at the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Yeah. And um, I, along with 12 other students, uh, were able to learn a lot of leadership skills as well as see the area and um, grow in character and such. So it was a wonderful opportunity by far. Did you make some neat connections with some students from around the world? <laughs> Definitely. Um, I, uh, I still like message. Aria from Guam every day. Oh, really? Oh, that's cool. And they know where Belton is now, right? Yeah, we're on the map. <laughs> that's <a good one. laughs> okay. Let's take a picture. Congratulations. Thank you. We're proud of you. Uh, the S2S program does a great job. This is a tremendous program making a difference uh, for students coming new to, for those of you who don't know, the student, student program is welcoming new students into Belton High School. Big, big place and can be a little scary for somebody new, but you know, I feel welcome and connected. We'd be lost without this program. And Ms. Orman makes that organization happen. Awesome. We're really proud of you, America. Thank great you. job. Okay. <laughs> All right, do we have some area, all area choir students out there? Bring up the all area choir. I knew that. <laughs> they might be in the hallway. Oh, it is just two. The all area choir is a, a selected through a very competitive audition process uh, that took place earlier this year. And we're excited tonight to recognize yeah. seniors Adriana Hernandez and Connor Cox, who were both selected through that audition process for the all area choir. <laughs> Our uh, high school choir directors are Craig Petruca and Leslie Wells. Okay, you have the class. Immensely talented young people who make beautiful music. Next up, middle school regional jazz band. Who's got that group? All right. Mr. Camden's got some certificates for you. Get in that picture with them, Leo. Okay, Mr. Beer. This is another very competitive audition process. About 150 middle school students audition for the regional jazz band. Just 20 are selected. What's exciting about this is that South Belton Middle School had six students who earned spots in the jazz ensemble along with two students who earned honorable mentions. This was double the number of students that South Belton Middle School has had selected last year. And it was also more than any other school who had students audition for the regional jazz band of course so we're excited to congratulate tonight Logan Morales Nick Sullivan Joshua Fuentes Rianne Sabrito Lexi Best Ethan Rasmussen and um, also the two alternates who received honorable mention Joseph Knox and Zachary Dennison um, we have three or excuse me we have four students in the group who are previous all region musicians continuing that success and their director is Chris Pulley. Awesome. This is a great group.
Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Whoa, almost went down. <laughs> that was almost too exciting. <laughs> Chair went out from under me there. That was almost more exciting than I wanted it to be. Uh, fine arts are alive and well. Uh, great. Our uh, jazz band uh, does great things. I hope you've had an opportunity to hear them. Okay, our next group we'd like to recognize is the Middle School Regional Choir. Continuing the theme of highly competitive fine arts programs excelling, um, we're excited to recognize our students who were selected for the regional choir, um, starting with South Belton Middle School. If y'all if will group with your schools, hang on, let them get up here. Y'all will group with your schools, they're going to help give you some certificates. So, should have done that earlier. Okay, get in the lane. There you go. Get with your teacher to help. Squeeze on up. Some of y'all can stand up on the podium. I can't hear y'all. Back up on the podium. I put my name on things. It means I'll be seen. Oh, yeah, you're going to jail. Yeah. You're not both. Can we share a sale? I'm sure. I'm sure. Y'all feel free to come on up. You want to take pictures? We're happy for you to come up and take pictures. We'll pose them and hold them in that pose as long as we need to. But we'll talk about them here in just a minute. Okay. All right. Let's talk about them. So starting with South Belton Middle School, our regional choir students are Rachel Schiller, Tori Pate, Haley Arnold, Bethany Fitzwater, Jessica Viles, Kara Shin, Cozy Anelli, Madison Moreno, Madison Farwell, Josh Lanirate, Corbin Hammonds, Daniel Holcomb, and Stephen Hansen. From North Belton Middle School, we have Sarah Millington, Macy Pacinic, Madeline Bradshaw, Mason Warren, Ethan Matus, Robert Brown, and Joshua Martinez. And from Lake Belton Middle School, we have Madeline Fogel, Annalise Miller, Heidi Foster, Kaylin Bond, and Jackson Reisner. And I also want to recognize our middle school choir directors who are up here, Charlotte Werman from South Belton, Alicia Martinez and Terrence Livington from North Belton, and Cheryl Kibbe from Lake Belton. Awesome. OK. Everybody look to the middle. Look to the middle for your picture. And then y'all come take all the pictures you want. <laughs> we are proud of y'all. Great job. Well done. All right. Next group to come in. Oh. One more pause. There you go. Good job. Good job, y'all. Keep singing. Keep singing. You're welcome. And our next group is going to be the powerlifting. Girls powerlifting state qualifier. Yeah. <laughs> All right, come on up, stay powerlifting. Good Norwood, y'all come on up. Throw it over, he has a certificate for those of you that are here. I should have more than this. Yeah, where's the rest of the class? Yeah, they're trying to get through the take much. So we'll wait till they all get frail. in. Come on up. I feel frail, if that counts. Come on, we need the power lifter. Come on, come on. There you go. Thank you. That was great. There's more. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, yes, I saw that. Yeah, you would get overwhelmed, Jeff. There you go. Come on up. Oh, good. We're about to bling. That's what we wanted. Yeah. Thank you for bringing bling. Give them their bling. How are you? Yes, I do. I'm there every day. There you go. Slide around. Keep moving down. Come this way. Come this way. Thanks. Nice. I like it. Show off that blade. Come on. Don't be shy. Come on. You gotta work hard to get some blame. Might as well. I'm right here. There you go. Uh -huh. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's the great thing about it. It's just getting to your age category. Weight category. Alicia's not here. Alicia's not here. Thank you. 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 Thank
um, and very much like those community leaders that TJ celebrated, he himself challenged people to look beyond their stereotypes. Hang on, wait a minute, don't leave, Jeff. Pay attention, look at, look at Sandy. Yeah, focus on Sandy, let's get a picture. All right, are, are you dressed as the famous TJ Collins or are you, just, are, are you dressed as, okay. That is awesome. <laughs> Folks, I hope you had an opportunity to see the videos uh, that were posted on Facebook each day. Um, uh, this young man's amazing. Uh, saw him on the TV news multiple times, uh, all over the media, really impressive. And I know his parents would like to take all the credit for that. But you know what? No, I say that because they said, this is his, right? TJ did that. Man, that says a lot about your family. Proud of y'all. Thanks for being here. TJ, we're proud of you. Thanks for leading. All right. Next, we're going to recognize who's next? The Rotary Educator of the Month for the Temple Rotary Club. Uh, thank you. We get to recognize the uh, Temple Rotary Educator of the Month. And this month, it's Legay Pittenger from Lakewood Elementary. Legay is a fifth grade teacher at Lakewood. She's in her 26th year of education and her 24th year with Belton ISD. She serves as grade level leader and frequently mentors new teachers to her team. She shares her joy of teaching and learning and models being a lifelong learner for her um, students and the adults better. around her. Her steadfast dedication to public education was rewarded as she was honored as the Belton ISD Elementary Teacher of the Year, the Region 12 educator teacher of the year and she was one of only three finalists for the texas teacher of the year judy schiller principal at lakewood stated legay pittenger is a master teacher that provides her students with a welcoming structured and accepting environment while holding each student to the same high expectation she represents the best of the best in doing what is right for her students so thank you for your service and congratulations i'm pretty proud of that one <laughs> hey, just so you know, because she won't tell anybody, I get to be her guest at the governor's mansion uh, in a couple of weeks. She's specially invited, and she got to take a guest, and so I get to go along. Nice. Works out well for me, apparently. Come on. <laughs> Good job. She's glad she can stay um, still with all the distractions I'm sure she has. Exactly. That is key. Moving along, let's recognize our Big Red Community Partner of the Month, Animal Medical Care in Temple. Our career and technical education program offers students interested in the vet tech track a great opportunity, which is the opportunity to earn a certification while they're still in high school. But it requires a tremendous amount of support from the community because of the hours that those students need to get in a veterinary clinic to move towards their certification. Animal Medical Care in Temple has been a huge support for the program by providing the opportunity for those students to get that hands-on learning experience and to do the real work towards earning their certification. So we're really excited to recognize Animal Medical Care as this month's Big Red Community Partner and uh, we're joined by Dr. Cruz tonight to accept the award. Thank you. Thank you for providing opportunities for our students. It's a great program. Students really love this program. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're part of the reason for like, why they love that opportunity. Thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for it. Thank you. Right, we appreciate it. Thank you. One of our great. Uh, you know, one of the things that we have. Uh, really prioritized and, and value greatly is our partnership with our community in giving our students opportunities. Um, and I think uh, that's a good representation of the opportunities our students have that, that uh, students everywhere don't have. There are so many great things happening in our school district. Um, and, and as many as we recognize tonight, we've got a bunch more to recognize because just this past weekend, we had more students. Our Magic Bells were, were succeeding. We have more jazz band recognitions, our CTE, uh, students are, are excelling some FFA uh, accomplishments. Uh, Dr. Dubois, I'd love to talk about our district UIL champ academic championship, but we'll hold that for next uh, next month and we'll let you brag on those students. Um, our Lady Tiger soccer team by district champions and moving on, they'll have a game on Thursday for the area. 
uh, doing great things. And so there are things going on all over our district with our students and so much to recognize and, and it's exciting. So we'll look forward to bringing some of those students back next month. I want to thank those who had a, a role in participating in in making public Texas Public School Week a great thing. Uh, thank you to all your principals and, and teachers and staff who opened up your campuses for our community and allowed them to, uh, us to join. Uh, and some of the great things happening on your campus. Uh, it was fun to show off to those who, some who hadn't been in, in our schools in a while. And so that's some wonderful uh, opportunities there. Today, I wanna say a special thank you uh, to the Belton Education Re Richmond Foundation. Today, uh, they held their uh, annual golf and first annual tennis tournaments at Wildflower Country Club, uh, big turnout. A wonderful event, and uh, our own Jason Carruthers is part of the winning team on the golf. How about that? Yeah, there you go. But the real winners of, of that event are our students who will receive scholarships uh, because of that participation. Again, another great partnership with our, with our group. Um, lastly, if you'll join me in saying happy birthday, Kyle. <laughs> Kyle gets to spend his birthday at a board meeting. Isn't that a great thing? <laughs> happy birthday, Kyle Beer. Okay, do we get them all? All right, we're good. No, we're not going to sing happy birthday. That's a little too far. You can sing later. You can sing later to him. Okay. That's enough embarrassment for him. Um, I didn't see anyone uh, signed up to uh, for any comments, but it, uh, anyone wishing to make any public comments may do so at this time. Seeing no takers, we've already done the consent agenda, so we'll move on to the superintendent's report. We have some really important business to do tonight. There's nothing we're going to do that's going to beat the last half hour worth of recognition. Those kids are I fun. Tell you. Yeah, absolutely. So a few items this evening. Um, first, star testing. This week, um, we, we will be administering the state required state assessments of academic readiness, the star test as we know them. Um, that begins tomorrow. Um, tomorrow we'll be testing writing for grades four and seven math for grade five, reading for grade eight, and our English one end of course exam at the high school level. On Wednesday, our fifth graders will test for reading, eighth graders for math, um, and as you may recall, students in grades five and eight are required to pass the reading and the math in order to be promoted, and they're given three opportunities to do that. Um, this week's assessment represents their first opportunity um, those students who are not successful have the opportunity, the next opportunity to do that on May the 8th and 9th. Um, so it's an important year for students in grades five and eight. On Thursday, our sophomores will take the English two into course ass assessment. Um, and those students um, do have multiple opportunities to test as well. And so students who are not successful on this go around um, will test again in June, June the 19th through the 23rd. Um, of course, most of them are going to be successful the first go round. However, we um, they do get another opportunity. We're also administering the state required Texas English language proficiency assessment system, the TELPOS, um, to our English language learners in K-12, and that assessment measures listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Um, and that's an important test for those students. And then beginning April the 3rd, we will administer the STAR, STAR Alternate 2 assessment for special education students um, who are identified for that assessment. So a lot of testing um, that begins tomorrow as a, as a part of our required uh, state testing system. And we just wanna say thank you to our campuses and to our teachers um, as they work to administer those tests and um, appreciate them for the work that they've done to prepare our students. You know, we know our students will do well. They always do. Our, our teachers and administrators and staff do a great job of preparing them to excel and, and we have high expectations, but it's, it's important for us to always pause and remind all of us that it's ridiculous what they're being asked to do. And uh, we've taken a stand as a board and as this district that we don't believe that this, this over-reliance on high stakes testing is good for kids, it's bad for kids. It's not good for public education, it's not good for children. And, and um, we'll continue to advocate for changes in that area. I've had several conversations just in the last few days, examples of how inappropriate some of the things are, the questions that are asked, um, but 
understanding that and understanding that we as a district believe in measurement and assessment of students in a wide variety of ways uh, outside of high stakes testing. Um, thank you for those of you that are, that are doing the extra work to help our kids succeed on something that is designed to help them fail. That's a sad thing, sad commentary on the state of our society, but, but the reality is in Texas and around the country, high stakes testing is designed to help students and schools fail. That's its purpose. But you're working hard to make sure that they're successful so that they can move on and do the important work. So thank you for that. Thank you for what you're doing. And, and uh, we look forward to getting past this so that more great education can happen in our classrooms. And those tests, remember, are only one measure of our student success. And, and um, we know that. Uh, that brings us to our legislative update this evening. And there are some um, bills that address testing. However, I'm not speaking to the, any of those this evening. Um, I could do that at a future date if you like. Um, but some interesting information. One of the bills um, that's being discussed this week includes House Bill 2051 by Dan Huberty. Um, this bill raises the amount of the new instructional facilities allotment to $1,000 per student in ADA at a new campus. Um, the current allotment is $250 per student, and that is given in the first year of the opening of a school, and then any additional enrollment in the second uh, year of an opening of a school, um, that ADA also receives $250. Um, you may remember or may not that the new instructional facilities allotment was cut, um, completely zeroed out the session before last and was then restored during the last legislative session. And we got caught um, in the timing of that cut and then the restoration. And so we were not able to benefit from that allotment um, on our last three schools, High Point Elementary, Chisholm Trail Elementary or North Belton Middle School. Um, and that, sh that funding should have never been cut, period. <laughs> that was important funding for a fast growth school district like Belton ISD. Um, our estimate for um, those new schools, uh, were just in the first year alone, that would have been an op uh, approximately $400,000 for Belton ISD um, because of that cut by the legislature. And it certainly would have helped us to offset some cost of opening a new school with personnel and materials and things that we need. Um, so with that um, estimation, if we were to estimate approximately 1,000 students at the new high school at the time of the opening and 500 students, for example, at the new element, elementary school, our current legislation at $250 per ADA um, in the first year alone would give us $375,000 in new instructional facilities allotment. If that is raised as Huberty's bill um, calls for, if it would be raised to $1,000, that would give us $1.5 million just in that first year alone. And so that would certainly help us to offset the costs of the opening of the proposed new schools. And so that's a bill that we're in favor of. And, um, and the Fast Growth Schools Coalition is also advocating for that bill. So um, that's one to watch. There's another one um, that's similar um, in, in that it addresses the new instructional facilities allotment. I don't have the bill number with me, but I, I would mention that it allows for uh, the use of repurposed facilities to qualify for the new instructional facilities allotment. So that bill would help us with the with fourth middle school, yeah. um, which would essentially be a new campus for Belton ISD and a repurposed facility. So we'll be watching um, bills related to um, instructional facilities allotment. Um, the next one I want to talk about Before is... Before you leave that, uh -huh. it, it's significant to note, those are House bills, and while we continue to see the House um, and, and Chairman Huberty uh, and a representative Hugh Shine, who represents us, being very supportive of public education and trying to help and uh, even some efforts to equalize some funding by raising the basic allotment. Uh, the Senate continues to be extremely hostile towards public education and um, they're zeroing out um, those kinds of things in their budget. And so uh, we are, are represented well in the House uh, and, and in public education. Uh, there was a, great, a big rally down at the Capitol this past week in the Save Our Schools, uh, and it, it's very clearly up to the House to stand firm 
for what's right for communities and public education against the Senate who is strongly trying to dismantle public education, it would appear. And speaking of the Senate, um, last week the Senate Education Committee voted out Senator Larry Taylor's voucher bill, Senate Bill 3, and one of the things that they cited was that um, that this would, would solve the enrollment growth problem. Um, as you know, 80% of all of the student growth in Texas is in just 75 fast growth destination school districts with Belt and ISD being one of those districts. And we certainly don't believe that our families are moving here um, to take advantage of a voucher system. So instead of funding public school facility needs and providing um, property tax relief to our taxpayers, uh, the Senate's solution is to divert over $300 million away from public schools to fund that uh, voucher bill, Senate Bill 3. And so we don't believe that fast growth districts should be the excuse for, um, per for pursuing those vouchers, and that certainly seems to be the case with the conversations last week. Um, Senate Bill 3 would create a system of education savings accounts and tax credit scholarships. Um, students who leave public schools could use the saving account, savings accounts to pay for a variety of educational services, including tuition for private schools, online courses, et cetera. Um, and then for each student who leaves public school, Senate Bill 3 would redirect a portion of the per student state money um, that the school district receives to those, um, those accounts. School choice legislation is a priority for Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and for Governor Greg Abbott, um, who's pledged to sign any bill that reaches his desk. Um, the reception in the House, however, has been um, quite lukewarm, and we continue to hear um, from Representative Hugh Schein and others that the House is not likely to support such a bill. So we, we have some hope there. Um, we're also continuing to study House Bill 21, um, which is also a Dan Huberty bill. It's the school funding bill. Uh, Representative Schein has actually scheduled a conversation with our area superintendents for Thursday morning. Um, to discuss that bill with um, Dan Huberty, so we're um, we'll get some more. We'll be studying that one closely, and then finally, um, I attended the Temple uh, Chamber of Commerce's Legislative Committee um, meeting, where we recently where we discussed legislation impacting our schools, um, our cities, our, our counties, our realtors, and um, healthcare, and that was quite interesting, and lots of needs and lots of concerns um, for all from all of those entities. Great. Thoughts on that? Okay. Aspiring, Legislature stays on. It's moving. It's moving fast, and we are we're working to um, to follow and track. Important this. for us to continue to advocate uh, as board members uh, to advocate for our community, and 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 the good news is we have a receptive representative who is advocating on our behalf. So. It's working very hard for us, and we're we're very um, pleased. Um, Aspiring Administrators Academy, um, our first ever Aspiring Administrators Academy will um, culminate in a special celebration on April the 25th. That will be held at the New Tech Megabytes Cafeteria from 4.15 to 6 o'clock. Um, each of our participants will be presenting an overview of the leadership projects that they conducted um, as a part of the program this school year. And so I'd just like to thank Dr. Charla Trejo um, for taking that on. That was a group of 18 of our aspiring leaders, and she did a really great job with them where she is. She's, she went home ill today. So um, Next up is BISD Reads. Um, we're pleased to be partnering with Fort Hood. Uh, for their 30-day reading challenge. Throughout the month of April, we'll be encouraging parents of our elementary students to read with their child for at least 30 minutes, or 20 minutes each day. Um, and so we will be sharing photos of parents and students reading on social media using the hashtag BISD Reads. And so that's a great project, project in uh, conjunction with Fort Hood. Me, good. And then finally, our bond program update. Um, Jared Sturzinger from O'Connell Robertson gave you an update of the work re regarding the schematic design process for the new elementary school and the second comprehensive high school. Um, we've been very pleased with the work that has taken place so far. 
Um, undertaking the schematic design process uh, now will allow us to share more information about the proposed facilities with our voters. Will also allow us to keep the timeline uh, that was presented by the architects, which sought to reduce inflationary costs uh, while opening the new facilities in 2019 and 2020, respectively. Um, while we're planning with our architects, we are also continuing to focus on getting bond information out to the community. Um, I'm giving presentations to com community organizations each week. You've been getting those uh, lists and we'll continue to do so over the next several weeks. We expect lots of people to vote in this election and are inviting people to pledge to vote at bisd.net slash vote. At that link, voters can uh, request to see, receive a reminder via a text message or an email um, to, uh, about voting. And then this evening, we've provided you with a copy of a brochure um, that you have with information on Belton ISD's fast growth, the proposed bond program, its projected cost, and where to vote. Uh, we have extra copies available on the back table this evening. And that brochure is being widely distributed across the community. I have had some employers who've asked to have copies so that they can share in their workplace, and we're working to get that out. Um, we also have a number of resources on our website, including the answers uh, to about two dozen frequently asked questions drawn from community presentations and your discussion last month. And you can find those questions and answers at bisd.net slash bisd2025. And we push that out today on our social media account. Great, so, great. That's it. Great. So important for us to be sharing information with our community and getting information out. That's a responsibility we have to, uh, to share that. And so appreciate the work, um, Kyle and uh, you have done to uh, provide that in, in multiple formats verbally through some presentations in written format and the website, certainly on the website and uh, uh, that's good. We just need to continue to push the information out so that people can make informed decision Great. on how to vote. Great. Any other questions anybody has? Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, let's talk about employees. Mr. Schiller, by the way, really nice picture. <laughs> Thank you. He was excited to do that. We uh, have two recommendations for you this month. Um, we have an LSSP intern that we're recommending and a audio video production uh, teacher uh, that we're excited about. And we have received and accepted five resignations of this month. And we have uh, 20 active positions for the upcoming school year that we're working on. Now these two are both for next school year. They won't start. They're, that, they're not for this year. We're hiring for next year. That is ahead of time, hiring so. for next year and they're included, they will we'll be included in the budget that we present. Great. So these are are not new positions either. Great. These are refilling positions that will be open for next school year. Yes, sir. Great. Is there a motion to approve? <laughs> motion from Mr. Camden, second from Mr. Crothers. Any questions, comments? All in favor of the motion, raise a hand. Thank you very much. You. Passes unanimously. All right, next item. Let's talk about, uh, I figure where I am. Oh, the delinquent tax collection report. Harvey Allen is here with us. Thank you. Harvey with uh, McCree, Veselka, Bragg, and Allen, PC. Uh, Harvey comes each year and gives us the good news about our um, efforts to have uh, everybody to take care of their responsibility, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I believe this is the same report we have electronically in our packet. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Great. But I understand we have a little technical difficulties. So okay, <clears throat> we're good. Yep, great. I think you get to watch the We screen. can kind of see a little, yeah, but this is in our packet on our website, so also. So I'll make sure it's not different. <clears throat> Members of the board, Dr. Ken Cannon, uh, already been introduced by the president, but I am Harvey Allen with McCurry, Basalka, Bragg, and Allen. <coughs> Our law firm represents the Tax Appraisal District of Bell County, which of course provides all the tax collection services to the Belton ISD as well as all the other tax units in Bell County. <coughs> Our firm is under contract with the Tax Appraisal District of Bell County to provide various sorts of legal services 
to the appraisal district. Uh, we, of course, uh, assist them in administrative matters. We represent the appraisal district before the appraisal review board. Uh, when the appraisal district becomes a defendant, when a property owner sues the defendant, uh, or sues the appraisal district, rather, we provide the defense for the tax appraisal district. And of course, we also collect <coughs> delinquent taxes that are due to <coughs> the tax appraisal bill county uh, in addition to that, as a part of our representation, uh, and last year, uh, we uh, filed an appeal for the Belton ISD for your property value study. Uh, we, uh, we moved the district from uh, into the competence center, which meant that you uh, got all the state funding you were entitled to. Uh, we also filed <coughs> two uh, requests for audit for taxable value uh, so that the state could document that the district had less taxable value than what had been initially reported, again, uh, resulting in an enhanced state aid for the district. Uh, we provided all these services at no cost to the Belton Independent School District, or for that matter, the tax appraisers for Bell County, because the delinquent property owners from whom we collect delinquent taxes pay all of our fees. Uh, and of course, as most of you know, McCreeva, Sucker, Bragg, and Allen is also a proud annual sponsor with, uh, with, with the beef and uh, your, uh, your annual uh, fundraiser there. Although I haven't used my, uh, my golf <laughs> for welfare. I plan on doing that. that. Anyway, um, <clears throat> with all that having said, I'm going to start actually get into the report. Uh, it's chart number one on page three. Uh, and chart number one is the total revenue from tax collections. Chart number one includes the current tax collections as well as delinquent tax collections, as well as penalties and interest that are collected on those delinquent taxes during each of the last four fiscal years. As you can see from the table at the bottom, for each of the four fiscal, for the past four fiscal years, the Belton ISD has actually received more than 100% of its adjusted levy. That's on chart number one and the table at the bottom on page three. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so as I always said, this is the most important chart I consider uh, for the administration and the Board of Trustees because this actually lets you know exactly how much money you have to operate the district on from tax collections anyway. So uh, <clears throat> that is... Uh, I consider that to be a, a pretty good chart. Any questions about uh, chart number one from memory members of the board? It's all if good. Not, I'll move to uh, <clears throat> chart number two. Chart number two uh, reflects um, taxes that are collected through December 31st of 2016. Uh, for the last four taxing units that have, or tax years rather that have been turned over to us. 2016 is not there because frankly 2016 is not referred to us until July 1st of 2017. But <clears throat> with the chart you see there reflects the cumulative collection percentages of the last four years worth of adjusted tax levies. Uh, it does not include penalties and interest which chart number one did. But this actually shows you that uh, for the 2012 tax year, uh, at this point, the Belton, or th as of December 31st, 2016, I'm sorry, the Belton ISD had got 99.72% of all the levy that it had <coughs> assessed. <coughs> 2015 is 99.27. The difference, of course, is just the passage of time. Now, again, that, is <coughs> that chart is both the efforts of the tax appraisers of Bell County collecting current taxes, as well as us collecting delinquent taxes. Chart number three on the next page is actually just the work of my law firm. Uh, again, as it indicates there, you see the July 1 original delinquency that was referred to us. Uh, you see the taxes that remain outstanding as of December 31st, the collection of those taxes on a cumulative basis, and then the percentages there. For 2012, we've collected 87 87.5% of the delinquent taxes that were referred to us and then you see the to 2015, in six months at that point, we collected 55.97% of those taxes that were referred to us. Again, that does not include penalties and interest that were, include, that were collected on those amounts. Is there any questions? 
again, if you compare these charts back and forth, again, you will readily see that for 2014, 13, and 12, there's less than one half of 1% of your adjusted levy remaining outstanding. On charts of four through seven on the following page, uh, you will see, uh, again, the, the green portion of those pies is exactly what you just saw on chart three. What this really reflects is what's the status of those taxes that remain outstanding as of December 31st of 2016. <clears throat> and what you see is a normal progression of the collection of delinquent taxes, where you go from chart number four, where we've, that's, uh, represents, <clears throat> excuse me, six months of the collection activity, to go to 2012, and you see where, where we are. Um, the various categories, et cetera, again, it just reflects those taxes and those collection statuses of those taxes for that particular tax year. Any questions on that? You go to chart number eight on uh, page number nine. <clears throat> there it gives the total balance of delinquent taxes for 2015 and prior as of December 31st, 2016 for the Belton Independent School District. <clears throat> uh, I would point out to you that as of December 31st, 16, there was $1.158 million outstanding. This same time last year, there was 1.259. So the actual amount of delinquent taxes has decreased by $100,000 over the last, um, <clears throat> last 12 months. The bottom part of the chart, chart number nine, gives the distribution of the delinquent taxes by tax year. As you know, it's, it's the normal distribution that you would expect with 2015 being the largest pie and then going around. Again, to put that in perspective, drawing you back to charts three and four, you know, I point out to the fact 2014 taxes, you have $158,000 outstanding. That's 13.6% of the total amount. However, that's 99.5% of your levy collected and 76% of the taxes that were referred to us. <clears throat> At the chart, <clears throat> top on chart number eight, again, this is a snapshot balance sheet approach, if you will, to what's, what is the status of that $1.158 million. And you see the, <clears throat> the status of those uh, taxes by category. Uh, the largest, what you would anticipate, of course, is under suit and judgment. But I would bring your attention to what is denoted as insolvent personal and unknown addresses. Uh, that's $152,000, and uh, that's 13%. And then you have the tax deferrals over 65 and disability. <clears throat> the portion that's uh, insolvent personal, for the most part, uh, is, uh, is uncollectible because, for the most part, the businesses against which those taxes were assessed are no longer in operation. And there's no personal liability, nothing to go get. The tax deferral or over 65 <clears throat> for residents homesteads of individuals who are 65 years of age or over or who are disabled, they have an absolute right to defer the payment of their taxes. And in the Belton ISD, um, <clears throat> $142,000 worth of that has been deferred. That will eventually be collected uh, when the, uh, the homesteads in question are long, no longer owned by individuals 65 years of age or older or have a disability. So that's merely, again, as a deferred, it will eventually be collected. Any questions on chart number eight or nine? Okay. After that, the second half of the report, beginning on page 11, you merely goes through the collection activity in which we've engaged on behalf of the Belton ISD uh, for the period from July 1, 14 through December 31st of 16. It goes through the, uh, the notices and litigation, uh, et cetera, through tax sales we've held on behalf of the district. Uh, that's the ultimate remedy. Um, as I tell people, we're not in the real estate business. We don't want to be in the real estate business. Unfortunately, in order to uh, get folks' attention, sometimes you have to post a property for sale. During a period of time, we posted 101 price property for sale, but we only had to actually sell 43 of them, and six went in trust. So half of what we get posted for sale gets pulled before the actual sale date. And the balance of, frankly, most of the time tends to be vacant properties out near the lake or very distressed properties that are vacant and abandoned. So that is, uh, that is my report to the board this evening. 
If there's any questions on anything that I've reported to you. May I have any questions? You know, uh, certainly we've had a, a great working relationship with the uh, Bell County Appraisal District and with uh, you and your firm. Um, great service to us. Uh, it's important that everyone is held accountable for paying their fair share that, so that none of us have to pay more than what is fair. And so it's an important stewardship for trustees uh, that we distribute and, and share the, the cost equally and equitably. And so thank you for helping us with that and your work with the appraisal district to, to make sure that that's done fairly and legally. Keeping Absolutely. us honest. So thank, thank you. you very much. Good report, good information. Always helpful to have that, that information. So we appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay, the next item is for us to consider uh, approving the purchase of real property. Dr. Kincaid, you want to talk us through this item? I do. I'm excited about this item. Um, we've been able to successfully manage our fast growth because we planned for it and because this is a community that supports our kids. For example, in 2006, uh, Belton ISD purchased 85 acres near the intersection of FM 2483 and FM 317. In 2012, the voters approved the construction of High Point Elementary School on a portion of that site. And in May, our voters will consider whether or not to build a high school there. Um, if voters approve issuing bonds to fund the construction of a new high school there, it ha will have been nearly 15 years um, from the purchase of the site to the opening of that school. That reflects the long range planning necessary to manage um, the fast enrollment growth of our school district. In 2014, um, we asked our demographers to conduct a build out analysis of our school district to determine um, how many potential students we could we could have in the future and the primary goal of that analysis was um, really driven by the high school question and what that enrollment growth would look like in the in the future um, that study showed that we could have over 28,000 students in Belton ISD in in the long range future or way out there um, if that were to happen and at the high, high school level the analysis indicated that we could have up to 8,800 students in grades 9 through 12. That was an important piece of information for us um, as a committee of parents, educators, and community members um, as we developed our recommendations or the, the Citizens Committee developed, it, developed recommendations for our long range facilities plan. Um, they attached a great deal of significance to that number. Uh, and that analysis. And in their minds, um, it became a, a less of a question of whether or not there would be enough students for two comprehensive high schools and more of a question of when the district might have a need for three or more high schools. So tonight, um, as we continue to plan for the future, we're asking you to approve a resolution for the purchase of approximately 109.18 acres at Loop 121 and Shanklin Road. Um, that area being purchased is large enough to accommodate both an elementary school and a secondary school in the future. And the cost is, uh, one, uh, we've received the final numbers on that um, document today and that final cost is $1,529,000. So that's uh, slightly different than what's in your packet. The, the survey came in a little The bit survey came in, yeah. yes. So all the information we needed for closing. So that's the proposal. You have a resolution in front of you this evening. You know, it, it's significant as we uh, have gone through this uh, long range planning process over the last several years, we hear these demographers reports and as, as you look at them and we're gonna, uh, in, in our roadmap, to ro the roadmap to 2025, we focused on what do we need to meet the needs in this next phase um, and so, a fourth middle school, a second comprehensive high school, uh, certainly are part of that as well as elementary school. Um, but if you kept looking at all those demographers reports, we see that this growth doesn't stop <laughs> just as we build those. And so we need to continue to look ahead. So I appreciate you going back historically and saying, you know, it's 15 years and, and it's maybe not coincidental, but interesting that 
um, 15 years ago, we said that, and then that was one of the projections of in 15 years later, we may need another high school. <laughs> now, whether that site will be a site for middle school, a future middle school, or future high school is down the road, way down the road decisions, obviously. Um, but one of the things that, that in my time on the board, and, and you all have been, we all have been a part of, is planning ahead, looking forward, and in using good judgment to buy land when it becomes available because it doesn't always become available. And as we've seen land dis go away in developments, uh, we need to take advantage of opportunities to buy them, uh, buy that property at a good price when it becomes available. This is a good price, this is a good investment for the future needs of our school district. And so I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to see this come to us, even at this time, particularly at this time as we are looking at a bond issue for um, second comprehensive high school, fourth uh, middle school, and another elementary school. We need to continue to look ahead uh, for the future growth of our school districts. So good, good plan, good proposal. Thank you for working on that. Certainly want to thank Angela for her work uh, on our behalf uh, to get us to this point uh, as we have been working on this. So does anybody else have any comments about this? Would entertain a motion. I have a motion for Mr. Carruthers? To approve, um, make sure we say that properly. Um, resolution. Approves the resolution, right. Uh, to approve the resolution approving the purchase of approximately 109.18 acres of land, more or less J.P. Wallace Survey Abstract 906 and the A. Cervantes Survey Abstract 204, Bell County, Texas. Is that your motion, Mr. Crothers? That sounds like that's my motion. Great. Is there a second for that motion? I have a second from Mr. Cowan. Any other comments or questions? All in favor of the motion, raise a hand. And that passes unanimously. Again, thank you for your work on that. I'm excited about the con uh, meeting the needs of our growing uh, community and school district. Okay, next item. We want to talk about best practice in bond programs utilizing construction manager at risk method. Are you going to get us started on that? I will do that. Um, in January, you selected the construction delivery methods for the new elementary school and the comprehensive high school, new comprehensive high school, and you elected to proceed with an RFP for a construction manager at risk for the high school and competitive sealed proposals for the elementary school. The RFP for the CMAR was posted on March the 10th and the proposals are due back next Monday on April the 3rd. Um, and we will be asking the board to consider rankings of those proposals, CMAR proposals next month. Um, this evening, Michelle Morris, a partner with the law firm Morris, Rogers and Grover in, in, uh, in Houston is with us. Um, you may recall that this is the firm that, that handled our lawsuit, a successful lawsuit against the Attorney General. Um, Mrs. Morris has extensive experience in public procurement and contracting, all phases of bond planning, site development, and construction. Um, she regularly provides guidance to school districts and universities on key issues to assist in the effective implementation administration of large construction contracts and the CMAR delivery method. So this evening we've asked her to discuss best practices for the oversight of the 2017 bond program. Great, welcome. Um, you got to start with helping me with what your name is because I heard <laughs> Michelle and I see Mickey and what's what? Yes, my name is Michelle Morris. I go by Mickey. Okay, that works. Um, <laughs> and I'm so happy to be here. Uh, we have offices in Houston and in Austin, and I have devoted my entire legal career to doing uh, procurement, real estate, construction, facilities, law for education clients. So it's coming on 19 years now and uh, the kind of the specialty you know a lot of districts are aging landlocked districts but where I've done most of my work is in fast growth districts the suburban mid urban districts um, you go around the clock of, of Houston uh, Lamar consolidated Fort Bend Conroe Klein Clear Creek um, exploding um, I recently started working with Round Rock. We've been hired by Leander. And so uh, whatever your market area is, uh, the fast growth districts, probably the burning debate is 
construction manager at risk or competitive seal proposal. And it's funny, I was doing this training at uh, the annual TASBO Academy, uh, particularly on CMAR versus CSP, and really had an interactive group and, and listening to school districts talk about how they were big fans of construction manager at risk and then got burned and stopped using it. Uh, and I really wanted the districts to listen to each other and find out um, how they overcame their biases, either towards or against uh, CM at risk. And what I've learned over the years is, and, and I'm not trying to be flippant, but it was kind of like all of us grandkids trying to teach our Nana to use email. And it was complicated and she was frustrated and she tried it and she, you know, was convinced the government was spying on her and didn't want to do it anymore. And, you know, and, and she stuck with it and she learned and she figured it out and uh, which was new to her and figured out that when, you know, you know what you're doing and you figure out how to use it right, uh, it can be the best thing ever. And so I've seen districts um, get burned with construction manager at risk method. I've seen districts get burned by not using it. And so what I'd like to do with you all tonight is kind of talk about the pitfalls of it. For those of you who haven't worked with the method before, uh, it's different. Um, and there are some tricks to it, so to speak, but there are some critical things that I think uh, growth districts uh, can, can learn to do uh, to really get the maximum benefits out of construction manager at risk. And so when the legislature first authorized this method for school districts was back in 1997. And before that, it was just low hard bids. And they came up with a list of new methods to allow school districts to uh, get away from the lowest responsible bidder. And construction manager at risk uh, came out of that. And it's funny, at the time, I was just getting out of law school, but when I first started working, I think the first bond that I worked with, uh, uh, Pasadena ISD, their 2000 bond, uh, they had been using cost plus, which is about as close as you can get. So if you've ever had a home renovation uh, where you know, the contractor comes in and says, you know, I can either do this for a lump sum amount or you can pay the actual cost plus my markup. And unfortunately for school districts, a lot of contractors with the growth of the construction management at risk method, contractors who had never done it before decided I better start doing this or I'm gonna get left behind. I've gotta figure out how to be a construction manager at risk. And so um, I think the number one key that you all have to uh, get into place, so the, the number one uh, safeguard you have to get in place is a project manager because it's a different type of project to administer than a lump sum project. And uh, so I want to talk to you about the importance of a project manager. It's of course important to have a project manager on any construction project, but more so for construction manager at risk because administering the cost components of CM at risk is where uh, both the benefits are and where the, where the pitfalls lie. Um, on any project, your, your project manager is going to coordinate with the authorities having jurisdiction and making sure that you have utilities and uh, drainage and access. Um, they're going to make sure to work with your end user, your instruction and, and, and technology departments to make sure that you have uh, your, your technology planned out, your FF and E. Um, but the benefit of construction manager at risk is it allows you to hire the contractor before the project is designed. So in a traditional design bid build, you, your architect finishes designing the school and you put the plans out for bid and a general contractor says, kind of like name that tune, I can build that school for X million dollars. And when you have construction manager at risk, they come on board early on and work with the architect. And so understanding how important that pre-construction process is can really, really uh, get you off on the right foot or the wrong foot for construction manager at risk. Because the construction manager's job is to make sure that the design that's being put together is feasible, that you know exactly what it's going to cost you, no, no surprises on bid day, um, that it meets all the requirements of the end user so that you're not 
having to process a bunch of change orders uh, when, when things are discovered down the road and to make sure that the schedule is being maximized to order things like long lead items. If you have a long lead uh, item like a chillers or, or some type of brick that you want, you can get those things ordered if you have your contractor at the table early on where in a normal uh, CSP project you'd have to wait. So, but what's important about construction manager at risk is that because it's an actual cost delivery method, uh, you have to have a project manager that knows how to look at those invoices and figure out uh, are these costs that I'm being charged for this particular month, are they allowed by the contract? Uh, are they a, a general condition item that's subject to a cap? Are they a cost of work item that uh, is going to keep this project within the guaranteed maximum price? Is, are they asking for extra money for something that they shouldn't be asking for extra money for? And educating your uh, facilities department and your business office on how to process those pay applications is critical to making sure that you are only paying actual cost. Uh, that requires uh, working with an auditor, and I'm going to talk about that next. That's a critical piece of construction management at risk, is to make sure that you're taking advantage of the auditing aspect of it, because you don't have that right in a lump sum contract, not, not to that extent. Um, one of the biggest benefits, as I said, of a construction management at risk delivery method is that it's supposed to, if used properly, reduce change orders. And the critical piece of that is not only the pre-construction services, but watching every charge that comes through to say, wait a minute, was this something that should have been included in that guaranteed maximum price I got? Or is this something extra uh, that, I, that I really need to be paying for? Um, at the end of the day, there should be money left. The guaranteed maximum price, um, you know, a good construction manager at risk is going to err on the high side when they tell you, okay, I can build it for this amount of money because they don't want to be at risk for the overruns. So if you're really watching those costs uh, and watching the billings and exercising your right to audit, you should have savings back at the end of the day. Um, Typical role of a project manager also is to make sure that the stakeholders are informed to monitor the cost, see where you are, uh, extrapolate to see where you're likely to end up be at, uh, being at the end of the project. And uh, in, in my section at the law firm, every construction defect lawsuit I handle, there's this motto I say there is no substitute for getting out there in that little white truck. Uh, having that quality assurance monitoring at the site can prevent so many problems. Uh, you know, rebar falling down on the ground before a concrete pour. Things that you would think, how can somebody not notice this? But there's just no substitute for those quality assurance eyes on the project. Uh, and a good project manager will also uh, deliver bad news uh, along with good news saying, hey, we have a problem here. We had some extra rain days. We need to figure this out and, and head those problems, little problems, off before they become big problems. So the importance of an auditor. Construction manager at risk, because it's an actual cost plus a markup up to a guaranteed maximum price, uh, it's critical to have an auditor. And the most successful school districts that um, have experienced savings on construction manager at risk have worked with an auditor and for a couple of reasons. One, not just cost recovery at the end, but the very presence of an auditor uh, at the beginning of the project signals to the construction manager and to the subcontractors that somebody is going to be watching their billings to making sure that they're only submitting invoices for things that are properly allowed under the contract, things that are related to the project. Um, I had a client send me a, a, a stack of documents once and said, I, I think our CM at risk is charging us sales tax and we're not supposed to pay sales tax. And, and you are on certain things, not things fully consumed into the project. And I'm looking through all these invoices, uh, and it's sale ta sales tax on like 27 iPad covers. And I picked up the phone and I said, forget the sales tax. What are the iPad covers for? 
and uh, recommended at that point that they they get an auditor. And um, lo and behold, you know, their return was in the high six figures on that project. Um, you know, but if you don't know, you don't know. You have a, a CMA is telling you, well, we have iPads because it's a BIM project and, and we need covers. Well, uh, that wasn't allowed in the contract documents. I mean, so um, the auditors are also going to look at the documents. You know, construction management, uh, you can take all of these steps up front to have great contracts and a great set of bid documents to say this is this is all we're going to pay for and we're not going to pay for airline travel and we're not going to pay for sub guard and we're not going to pay for this but if if you don't have somebody looking at the guaranteed maximum price amendment and so those of you who've worked on a CM at risk project before um, there's a document that comes at the end of design. Now, when you hire these folks, you don't know how much the project is going to cost yet. Uh, you know what their markup is going to be. You know what their job costs are going to be. But you don't yet know what the school is going to cost because it's not designed. And once it's designed, the subcontractors all bid and, and you figure out uh, what the total cost is going to be. Um, the guaranteed maximum price amendment actually sets the cost of the project, the absolute maximum cost of the project that they can charge you. Um, I review GMP amendments for all of my uh, fast growth districts that use CM at risk, and invariably I will find uh, a phrase, a word, a footnote, a line in pages and pages of Excel spreadsheet that completely undermine, completely negate the auditability of the entire project. And, and an auditors are trained to catch those things. Uh, one example is the word stipulated. You know, they, they tell you what they're going to charge for their, their personnel salaries, uh, their car allowances, their safety, their job site trailers. And they may say, OK, it's going to cost 4%. Uh, it's going to cost 4% of the project. And what that should mean is all of these costs will not exceed 4% of the project. But you can find buried in a guaranteed maximum price amendment, no matter how great your contracts are, stipulated 4% general conditions fee. Now, legally, what does that mean? Well, that's an amendment to the contract if it's approved. And so I, I've seen a lot of districts almost get burned uh, because there's language in the contract amendment that undermines uh, the nature of the original contract. And so the auditors know these tricks. They review those documents. They uh, understand, you know, if, if this number is too low, it's too good to be true then they're going to be making a profit on their self-performed work, the things that they do themselves rather than putting it out to bid to subcontractors. Um, the good construction manager at risk firms, and there are good ones out there, they will tell you, uh, if you interview them, I welcome working with an auditor. I have no fear about it. You know, if my numbers are so low that it seems like a great deal, and you're afraid that I'm hiding it somewhere else, I'm not afraid of being audited. Uh, I will open my books to you. That is the very foundation of construction management at risk. It is a completely transparent actual cost plus an agreed upon markup. And if they're not willing to open their books on actual costs, uh, then you'd want to think twice about that. And, and, and the stories you'll get are, well, it's easier for you if we just agree to these rates up front. It's easier. The math is easier, and then you don't have to dig into what our labor burden really is and go through all these, you know, accounts and spreadsheets at our office. Oh no, I'd love to do that. <laughs> That's why we're using this method. Please, you know, and they'll they'll profess to want to make it easy for you and your staff by saying, let's just stipulate these rates and these charges and. Um, if, if everything's going to be stipulated as opposed to actual costs, then you're not getting the benefit of construction management at risk. And that's where the auditor uh, really uh, earns uh, their weight in gold. And, and many auditors will put in the contract, um, if we recover more than 1% in an audit of this project, then the construction manager pays our auditing fee. I always thought that was an interesting provision. Mm. 
So how do these folks compete? Um, the first thing you're going to see uh, when you look at a proposal for a construction manager at risk is what they're going to charge you for pre-construction services. This is that period of time where they come on board and the architect is still designing the project uh, before you've hired the subcontractors or bid out for the subcontractors before you figured out what everything's going to cost. Uh, this is a really critical piece, and I, I, warn, I warn districts to beware of the zeros or the people who say they'll do it for $5,000 <laughs> for a high school or for a new school because you get what you pay for. This is a critical piece of construction uh, delivery method that doesn't exist in your traditional CSP. This is where they get to sit down and tell the architect, this looks beautiful, but th I think this is going to cost a lot of money. I've worked with this roofing system before, and you know we've had these problems. Or we have a hard time getting this material. It's going to take longer. It's going to cost more. What about this? The collaborative process is very, very important. Um, you know, if, if they're just sitting at meetings and showing up at design charrettes, but they're not going back and, and um, doing the review and doing detailed cost estimating and feasibility studies, uh, then you can expect to see the very thing that you hope to avoid by picking this method, and that's change orders. Um, they will also give a lot of thought on how subcontractors are to be procured. One of the biggest tricks, and I certainly do not mean to cast aspersions on any uh, CM at risk firm, but I can tell you I've had some horror stories, and, and one of the things I've seen is um, if you don't have a lot of competition by the subcontractors to perform the subcontracts on your project, then um, one, you're not going to get great pricing from those that do respond, and two, if you have a construction manager at risk that likes to what's called self-perform, and some of them do, we do our own concrete work, we do our own carpentry work, um, there's not a lot of competition in those areas when it goes out to bid to other subcontractors for a number of reasons. One, uh, some subcontractors aren't going to want to bid against the construction manager because they want to maintain that relationship in case they ever need them on a different job. Uh, but it's interesting to see how those projects are packaged together. And uh, if they're packaged in a way that gives a competitive advantage to the construction manager, then you're not going to be getting the best price for it. And so part of that collaborative pre-construction process to make sure that before they all go out to bid, you can see, are they combining dirt work and glazing in one subcontract package. Well, how many companies out there do both dirt work and glazing? Not many. So chances are if your CM wants to self-perform that package, they're going to win that because they won't have a lot of competition. So uh, there's a lot of thought that goes into this. And so the time, the number of meetings, the man hours, that's money. So if you see a number of, of zero or, or, you know, you, will, you want to negotiate with that firm and find out how much time are you planning to spend at this phase to save us as much money to make sure we have the tightest drawings and specifications we can have and that we maximize competition for our local subcontractors to make sure we get good pricing. How much time have you invested in that? And that should come at a price. General conditions. General conditions are the actual job costs. These are the trailers, the porta potties, the you know security fencing, um, bonds, insurance, temporary power, and the largest piece of it are is the uh, salaries of the construction manager's personnel, their job site superintendent, uh, their project estimator, their uh, project engineer, their foreman. Um, a good procurement document is going to ask them for all of this information, not just a blank that says, you know, give me a total number. How much do they charge for each one of these? What is the unit price of a, of a trailer per month? What is your monthly salary for your project manager? What is the labor burden that goes into that? Because if you don't know what it is up front, how can you audit it to make sure that they've only charged you what it actually costs, what they say it's going to actually cost? And so you want those numbers um, 
to be clear. I want to know what I'm getting for this number. And uh, and I looked at your solicitation document, and it, it was very well done. It has a list. These are the things that you need to cover in that not to exceed amount for your general conditions. And if it's not on that list, don't send me a bill for it later. You need to factor that into your profit markup, which we're going to talk about next. But general conditions is probably the area uh, that I see the largest abuse in double billing, overbilling, including things that aren't supposed to be included, or just charging flat rates for things and there's not the follow-up to say, wait a minute, did you really spend $110,000 on street cleaning? Uh, you know, it was in the GMP up front, did you, did you really do that? Um, so you all have asked for a not to exceed number and that's the way it should be because your auditor uh, needs to have the ability to check those unit costs and make sure that it truly hasn't been ex exceeded. The third element of their pricing, so we have pre-construction services, we have general conditions, and then there's a the construction manager's fee. This is all you're going to know about their charges when you pick them because the project hasn't been designed. So the CM fee is the only uh, percentage that's actually fixed, and this is their markup for home office overhead and profit. Uh, you know, they're, they're technology specialists back at the office. They're um, their rent, you know, things like that. Um, anything that's not covered in that list of general conditions needs to be accounted for in this uh, profit markup. And you know, when I when I see a number and I want to think uh, think about a business, if I'm sure a lot of you are in business, think about what your profit margin needs to be for you to make a living at your business. And so when you're seeing numbers like 1%, and I see them, ask yourself, can, could I make a 1% profit and still stay in business? If, you know, if you see, look at the three numbers collectively, if you see, uh, if it looks to you like it's too good to be true, then you want to ask yourself, okay, where are those costs being hidden? And uh, they're in it for business purposes, but what I see happen is the competition is so feverish to get the job uh, that they will lobe all those numbers and think, well, I'm just going to have to have a certain number of change orders or a certain number, a certain amount of self-performed work to make that up. Uh, and so I've seen those numbers very low and, and you know, it's, it's not unusual that when you look at the fee number and you look at the general conditions number and add it together, you're still you know, you can still be anywhere between five and eight percent. That seems more reasonable, but it's still it's still pretty low. So, uh, I, I just want you to understand what that number is really for, so that when you see the numbers um, and working with your auditor, that you can ask yourself, okay, if this seems too good to be true, then I want to make sure that the auditor is checking that that these costs aren't uh, these uh, profit centers aren't hidden somewhere else. So these are the three things that will make up the contract to begin with, uh, the first three bullets there. And then the last bullet, once your GMP is developed, um, it'll include the construction manager's fee, the not to exceed general conditions amount, uh, and they'll apply that to the cost of the work, the actual cost of the work. So you won't know what that total uh, number is uh, until the very end of the project. And all of the cost savings uh, belong to you. And on a CSP project, you know, if, if the bid is $20 million uh, and it only costs them $17 million to build it, you'll never know. <laughs> That's just extra profit for them. But on a CM at risk project, you have a right to know. And that money not spent is your money. Any questions on that before I talk about prevailing wage? Okay, so I know that uh, you all are at the point where you're uh, looking to adopt prevailing wages or ad uh, update prevailing wages, and so I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, there are organizations that are trying to get Central Texas as active in developing local prevailing wage surveys as the Gulf Coast area has been. The Gulf Coast area has actually had a 
uh, an architect who's been doing that service for all the Gulf Coast districts for many, many years. Um, but the basics of the law is that in Texas, any laborer on a public works project is entitled to be paid a minimum prevailing wage. That's the law. And uh, you have to publish these wages in the bid documents, put them in the contract documents, and that's how the subcontractor employers can ensure that they calculate their bid accordingly to make sure that they're paying these minimum prevailing wages. You have two options under Texas law on how to uh, establish these wages as a school board. You can either conduct your own local survey or have it conducted for you, or you can default to the Department of Labor's uh, Davis-Bacon rates, which is the mandatory scale that you have to use uh, on certain federally funded projects. Or if you ever used QSCABs or QZABs, you, you had to use those rates as well. They're higher. The Davis-Bacon rates are much higher. The reason they're higher is they're largely union-driven rates. So if you're in a marketplace that's not heavily unionized, um, that's probably not the prevailing rate in your area. Houston is very open shop prevalent, probably 80-20. Uh, and so the w wages are much lower than Davis-Bacon in that area, and the same is true for the Central Texas area. Uh, also, the Davis-Bacon rates uh, include fringes. And when you conduct a local survey, you're only obligated to set the rate. You're not required to incorporate fringes or holiday pay, vacation pay, things like that. How do you do a local survey? Uh, really, it's you have to have a statistically significant sample. So. You know, the local, uh, the AGC chapter will give you a list of trades. You send out mail surveys, phone surveys to all the plumbers and the pipe fitters and the elevator mechanics and all the different trades in the area. And, you know, when you get, I've had surveys that I've uh, helped with where we may have only gotten two or three responses, but it was statistically significant and uh, at least tried to get multiple ones. Um, there are some categories that are heavily union driven no matter where you are. They're just going to be higher. Electricians is one of them. Um, what's interesting is when you do have a, a rate that's uh, union-driven, um, it's very important to maintain the ratio. And, and so let me give you an example. We had a, a category where we only got one open shop to respond, but the union shops uh, about eight of them responded, and they wanted me to average those nine together, uh, even though I knew that they were just being more responsive and it wasn't prevailing. So the AGC was very helpful in saying, well, in that trade area, you are, you know, 87% open shop and 13% union, and so I applied that weight factor to the union rate and the open shop rate and came up with that rate. Um, and uh, that's, how, that's how it worked out. But uh, I want you to know if you don't want to undergo the administrative hassle of conducting your own survey, um, you can have somebody conduct it on your behalf. So like many of the Gulf Coast areas have the architects do it, if there's an organization that will do it, provided they will document that they're doing it on your behalf, and they, it may be on other people's behalf, uh, and, and you document that, then it is simply just an outsourced survey. Well, I was going to ask, because you mentioned the AGC. Yes. And I know City of Temple adopted the AGC. Either that's, I thought they bought their survey. I wasn't sure how they got their numbers. Yeah. They used AGC. And then, oh, I'm sorry, can you hear me? And um, I believe Bastrop ISD was the one I was talking to that said that they got theirs from the Texas Workforce Commission. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and there are school districts that have entered into interlocal agreements with other governmental entities, like the city, uh, a city of Houston lends their study to Houston Community College through interlocal agreement. And so as a governmental entity, you certainly can share those governmental functions. You just want to document that you did share in that function. The critical part is making sure that the party with whom you contract to share that function or to whom you delegate that function is looking at your relevant market area. It, it seems logical that, that entities, common entities Absolutely. And areas go together. Yeah. ISDs that are local area, cities uh, such as you mentioned. So yes. this is seems it, logical to yes. do that. 
in and your workforce experience, is it, is it worth it? Yes, okay. absolutely. You will save quite a bit of money. Um, the cost to do that, even, it's still <coughs> well worth it. The return on investment is good. I. Absolutely. I, I think the cost, I want you to keep in mind that the cost is, you know, it's not the U.S. Census. I mean, it's... Right, right. It's, it's reasonable. It sure. should be reasonable. It should be reasonable. Uh, I, you know, it's the administrative time of doing initial uh, mail-outs or emails and, and following up with phone calls. And sometimes it does take a lot of phone calls to follow up and, and collect that data. But if you look at the Davis-Bacon surveys... You know, there's a finite number of categories because you have to fit them into certain categories. Um, but one of the biggest benefits, I'll tell you, is that you can use helpers in a local survey. And you can't do that under Davis-Bacon. And so you either have to pay a journeyman rate or you have to pay a registered apprentice rate. And, and a helper, unless it's just a general laborer, doing cleanup, if they're helping in any trade-specific category and they're not a registered apprentice, you have to pay them the journeyman rate. That's where the costs add up. So um, this is something, and, and Jeff, thank you for, for kind of bringing this up and talking about it. It's obviously relevant to uh, the members of our board uh, in your experiences, but I, you know, this is something that I would think that we are going to want to pursue. Mm -hmm. um, part of being good stewards mean monitoring how our, our Yes. funds are used and just as the auditor you can audit at the end or you can audit ongoing and and you may come out with the same project product at the end but but it just makes sense to do it ongoing looking for prevailing rates doing that just makes sense for us anything we can do to to protect um, we, unnecessary expenses if we do the study how long does it last I mean can we use one a couple of years old and all that the law in Texas is as long as it's prevailing. So, uh, yeah. isn't that great? Um, it long used to be. Do we get to de decide? Yes. The, uh, all the case law on this and the AG opinions on this, this give a tremendous amount of deference to the board to determine what is prevailing in their well, market area. And to challenge that <coughs> is really difficult. I mean, I, if you have the statistics to back it up, um, there used to be a rule under Davis-Bacon that um, any, in Texas had it and then repealed it, that any Davis-Bacon rate had to be uh, within three years, had to be done within three years. And, and Davis-Bacon does update theirs periodically, but there is no such rule in Texas for local prevailing wage surveys. Provided you still feel it's prevailing, uh, there's... I know one district, and I'm not going to call but, them out by name, that they had one for 14 years. Again, there are enough other governmental entities in our area that are doing construction projects that it just makes sense for yes. us to pool those resources and work together. And so, so I would encourage I, I, that to be I done. would ask, how long does it take to do your own survey, and do you recommend doing your own survey over using the AGC? So if AGC is doing one, um, I would let them do the heavy lifting and, and see what you can work out with them just because it would save you the administrative time. And you may find other uh, governmental entities in the area who want to go in with you on that. Again, mm -hmm. it seems to me that we could enter local agreement with the multiple and, and contract with somebody to do that for sure. us. Municipalities, for example. County, It just makes yeah. sense yeah. for us to work together. And so... Um, we, you know, we've done that on some other things, working together with, with and other entities. We ought to do as that. As far as the time, I would say, you know, a few months and a couple of months. But, you know, for, if you're using a construction manager at risk method, you've got time because your CM at risk will come on board. Those prevailing wage rates, that scale does not have to be in place until the subcontractor bids go out at the very end of design, closer to the GMP stage. That's not something you're going to need to have in place when you bring in your CM at risk. It's when you do the trade bids. Great. Okay. So I guess from that, um, from if there. you can work yep, towards that. Absolutely. But again, with a focus on working with other governmental entities in our area mm -hmm. and working together. Uh, who are interested, obviously. Yeah, They're sure. going to have to be interested, but I can't imagine why anybody wouldn't be. So, And there are other central Texas districts that I talked to that have 
yeah. known that this is a long time coming. That this this, is, this is a need and it's an area, it's an opportunity for us yes. to save uh, some money. Yes. And so that's a good thing, always a good thing. Yes. Great. Does anybody have any other questions, comments? Great, thank okay. you, appreciate it. Thank you for the sure. information. Thank you. Okay, well, Dr. Lovesmith, why don't you talk to us about advanced placement and dual credit programs. I mentioned a little bit earlier about some new classes, but give us an overview. I sure will. Um, so we saw as evidence tonight, and you mentioned actually, and I wrote down, um, we prioritize giving our students opportunities in Belton. And these are advanced pro placement and dual credit programs are some very exciting opportunities for our students. Mm -hmm. um, they are a way for our students to earn college credit or the potential to earn college credit while they're in high school. And so tonight, I really just wanted to highlight our progress on that. Um, just in case you all have, are not aware, we had in January a meeting with our parents, and I think you talked about that a little bit with our AP and dual credit opportunities. We had over 500 students and parents in attendance for that meeting. And so we know there is an interest, um, a, you know, as more than ever among our students and our parents for these options. We currently offer over 61, 61 advanced placement, Dual or dual credit courses um, with in, at Belton High School at New Tech, and then with our dual credit partners, and that is a phenomenal option for our phenomenal options for our students. Um, just as you recall, when um, students seek a, um, college credit for our AP courses, that is dependent upon an exam, and it's typically a three or higher is what their colleges need, although that's determined differently by every college. And then, of course, for dual credit, it's just dependent on passing the course. And that picture is just a highlight of last year we had five students, and um, those four that are pictured, that um, earned their associate's degree through the Bioscience Institute, and that's one of the measures we're excited about. I'm gonna break down rather quickly um, all of the different course offerings that we have so that you can see them, and then of course it was in the packet and it'll be posted for others. But in our, so um, I divided this up, our course op subjects, and you can see that we have over 160 students in either our advanced English 3 or English 4 AP courses. And then what I chose to do with every subject area was to also report the performance of students on AP exams. AP exams are not required. However, we encourage students to take those. And what's really exciting is that posted the average score of our students on those exams exams in comparison to the state score and the nation. And you will see that we are scoring higher than the nation on almost every assessment. Can and I ask you, exciting. before you go through those, and, and, yes. and, and it's really good news, so I, I, I want to stop you from doing that. Right, right, right. Uh, but not every student does. Do you ha have data and keep data on the percentage of students enrolled in those AP courses who take the AP exams? We have that data. Have we tracked that? We've talked about this a number of times in past years about how do you, you know, so we, you know, we have a lot of students taking AP exams mm -hmm. who want to do it for the grade points, but they don't do the test, which is not a good thing. And so we've pushed, we've, we've emphasized that in the past. I'm just wondering, are we tracking percentages and to see if we can push that along? We have those percentages and we can track them. I will tell you though, there are a lot of variables that come into play when a student or parent makes a decision as to whether or not a student will take an AP exam. Um, the state legislature has put into place that state institutions would accept credit when the score is a three or higher. However, many of our students are seeking to attend private universities or universities outside of Texas, and some of them do not want to get out of sequence with a college courses. So, um, you know, much like in Belton, we um, sequence our courses so that our Algebra 1 would be, for example, aligned to what's been taught in Algebra 2 um, at the university level. For instance, if you're a math major, then your entry math class would then feed to the next class in that sequence by those colleges. So some students want to take our AP, exam, AP courses for the rigor in those courses, but may or may not want to get out of sequence with their institution. So it's it's become an individual decision, um, and we haven't we have you know forced that decision. 
I understand, but the uh, the question that we've talked about in the past, at least, is mm -hmm. should it be assumed or required? Or I mean, and that's the, been the right. discussion in the past about mm -hmm. if you're going to take AP course, mm -hmm. get AP um, credits to get grade points. I'm sorry, let me be specific. If if your purpose is to get grade points, but you're not taking the exam, the exam is important, and it's, it's important for a lot of measures, mm -hmm. and it's it's a it's an outcome measure that's important right. to us um, to know whether those students are getting what they what they need. It's a, it's actually contrary to the high stakes testing that the state requires us to do. It's actually a valid measure that we would consider, right? I would say so. So so it would seem to me that we would, as we've talked in the past, we would want to encourage more and more of our students take a big mm -hmm. and we do we have more now right. than we used to i don't and know, it I'm is participation is an area we certainly and, and i really don't want to get you off yeah. your presentation because it's good stuff and no, we right. need to get I to that have, i just want to I raise that issue again. it's a valid point mm -hmm. because you you can look at the um, scores that deanna is presenting in one subject area and look at a different subject area but because the ap exams are not required you you have to understand what's behind the data, right. how many students took in one course versus right. another Absolutely. course. Right, um, absolutely. And students have to pay for these exams. And, if, and, and you know, I have a daughter at the right. high school. If she doesn't feel confident she's going to pass an exam, she may not want to register for the exam. And so there, there are um, there But she certainly, still wants the grade points. She still wants the grade points. So, and the question is, is that that's <coughs> part of that whole grade point question that we talked about when we've done that policy? Mm -hmm many times over the years but mm -hmm. um, and and maybe this isn't the place to complicate that but I <laughs> but I'd like to just put that back in the hopper is something that we should be monitoring so well we do continue to look at that and I will tell you um, as as with not only our AP courses but also our dual credit and how we weight those we are looking at not only how we are That's doing those processes but I've looked at other districts of similar size um, within Texas and within our cohort of comparison group to see how those districts, if they require the points, if they don't require them. So we continue to, re to review that as a whole, not just in our isolation. A long and we need to continue to be looking debate. at the debate. It is a long credit and AP and, 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 <laughs> and mm -hmm. AP with the exam, AP without the exam. Mm -hmm. You can't use the exam for, for grades, obviously, because the grade, the Results don't come back in time, but still, what's the what's the role of all that? There's a we need to keep thinking in that. We continue looking at it, and I, I, just to kind of end on that point, there's there's a lot that goes into play with making the decisions and what courses we offer, how we offer them, how we weight them, but then also how students and parents choose which of these courses are best for them. And it does become a very personal decision in terms of where they're going to school and in what they're majoring. And we talked quite a bit about that with parents in both the meeting that we had and then a Skylar that we sent out on that. Um, okay, back to, to pick your back really up. good report. Mm -hmm. um, also, <laughs> Um, in in math, you could really measure the strength. Of and the one thing I want to highlight in the various course areas, you will see a difference in the number of AP courses that we offer by specific content area compared to one another. So you saw two AP courses in English that will increase in our math and science. That is because of the number of AP courses available through the College Board. So there are limited numbers in English. We offer all of them, and then we offer all of them in um, math and science. So that will increase. Again, these are our math numbers. Um, again, you can see a um, almost 60, 70 um, students in our AP Calculus AB and then also Calculus BC. Those are two separate courses. And um, then our performance on those exams. Um, and those performances are an average of Belton High School and New Tech, just, just so that you know. Um, then you can see our science. You start to see the increase in our science AP courses. There are a lot of AP courses to offer at science. We do not have as many dual credit offerings in science. Instead, we have the Texas Bio Institute, which focuses on those, and there are eight students in that program. Also, I wanted to just highlight, um, I tried to put in a few examples. The, this picture is of our new tech students. They presented on the question, how can we limit humanities destructive impact 
impact on the environment without infringing on individual rights. And they presented that to Belton, Temple, Cameron, and Harker Heights land boards and economic developments. Um, and that was done in their AP environmental science class. Then we have our history. Again, the hist um, social studies is the area where we have the most AP courses, um, followed by also the dual credit. And um, this is a picture of students um, in a mock trial debate in Tanya Larson's AP history class at Belton High School. And again, we're proud. We, um, we have very, very large numbers here um, with over 120 students in US history and then 118, 120 in the AP government. So th this is an area where we have um, our largest number. In fact, it was so large there on the next slide are their results. Um, again, overall, we are outperforming the nation. There are a couple areas where, where we've identified to work on. Most of those are areas where we do have a lower participation of students taking the test. And so that, that score is not as high as we would like to see it. We continue to work. Um, the next slide is, is significant because um, here we are offering our AP courses in foreign language and also in music. And when you see 23 students this year in, enrolled in our AP music theory, we are ecstatic because last year we had like five to eight students. And it's an area we've really intentionally tried to grow for those kids that you typically think of as music majors going to college in that area. Um, and it is our only AP course that currently makes in the fine arts area. And so we're very excited to have that opportunity for our fine arts major students. And then we have AP Spanish 4. We will try to honor any AP request in French that we receive. However, that's um, not been a program that we've been able to really get students in the, that fourth year of, but we continue to work on that. And then we've shared this before, but I really wanted to highlight it again. This is our number of students that are designated as AP scholars in the um, AP scholar program. What's most significant about this is that you can see we've more than doubled our numbers of total scholars since 2010-11. Also, just to kind of put some of these numbers in place, an AP scholar is a student who earns three or higher on their AP exams. We had 47 of those students. A student recognized with honors earned an average of 3.25 with a three on four or more exams. So we had 16 students that took four or more exams. We had 33 students earn a three or more on five or more of the exams that they took. And then we had um, five national AP scholars, and those are students who scored an average of a four with scoring a four or higher on eight or more exams. That is pretty significant. <laughs> so we're pre we are... Um, <laughs> proud of those numbers and those students. To just kind of see an overall glimpse of the scores for students with a three or four high or, or higher, you can see Belton High School's data here, and you'll see that we had 67% of the students scoring a three or higher, and that is compared to um, the state at 50 and the nation at 60. Then I have spent um, a lot of time talking about the, the AP, but I also want to really talk about dual credit. And if you'll recall, over the last two years, we really looked into um, visiting some early college high schools. And we talked some about that. Um, an early college designation was sought by the state for, from high schools that partnered with their community college and pay for or provide um, dual credit to students. But what we've really taken a look at is what options are available to our students without having the early des high school designation, early college graduate designation, um, because it's not an option right now for us. And so what I did here was I just gave an example, given the new courses that we're going to be offering and really um, I contribute quite a bit of this to our online options because we're eliminating any barriers for scheduling for students. And what this shows you is that a student could in fact take um, the 26 hours of college credit their junior year followed by 26 hours their senior year. 
Now, there is a lot that goes into that kind of decision because it can affect the status of a student when they go into college. It could affect their college, um, their college scholarships, whether they're, um, they enroll as a freshman or a sophomore. Um, but, but what I really wanted to capture in, in this slide for you all is the opportunity is there. And so we have an expansive opportunity for um, any student at Belton High School to really consider dual credit college courses and, and determine a large number of those should they choose to. And then again, we'll be partnering next year with Temple College, UMHB, and also then the UTPB online. And then the last thing I wanted to show you is some of the data that we are gathering with our college board, from the college board with PSAT, and then a little bit about what we plan to do with that. So we administered the PSAT to all of our eighth graders. And what you can see on this slide is that our middle schools scored on average right about the same with the average score being a little over 800. And we can identify about 25 students on each grade level that scored 1,000 or higher. Um, with our ninth grade, you'll see um, the score average increase to right around 850, 900, or 898, and again, the increase in the number of students that are scoring at or above 1,000. And then in 10th grade, the test changes. It's no longer PSAT 8 or 9. It becomes the qualifying test for a National Merit Scholar. And you can see our, our scores on average increase in both 10th and 11th grade. We are going, and I'll talk a little about our plans, we're going to um, target students that are scoring in that 1,000 range and, and develop a plan um, kind of on a road to really look at improvement on PSAT and National Merit Scholars. Um, one, one thing we currently do is, of course, our BISD superintendent scholars, and we had 39 students last year that were recognized, um, scoring uh, in 10th grade on, in the 85th percentile on the National Merit Index, and we will recognize the next group in, um, on April 19th. I think you all actually were sent an invitation today to that. Um, what's next for the program overall? We have developed specifically a goal to expand the board uh, there's a board goal to expand the superintendent scholars program and what we really what that means and what we're still looking at um, how to exactly do that but it, it, we want to make it um, something that students are striving for that there's an internal interest among them with college site visits looking at transcript reviews their course selections PSAT preparation um, to really help them develop um, uh, there are the importance of National Merit Scholar and the importance of these tests. Um, while we won't identify superintendent scholars until after their 10th grade test, we plan on starting this with our 8th graders and looking at that PSAT data and who's in that um, group that we could really provide some intensive tutoring and a program to support them. And the so can, can I um, just say this is a board superintendent goal for this mm -hmm. year um, and this is one that that I'm particularly passionate about and the and the goal is motivation right we have the kids Absolutely. and the, we want to motivate our kids and um, really um, push them and and help them get something special so that they will understand the significance of scoring at a higher level on the SAT um, because they can do it mm -hmm. But they're busy and distracted and doing lots of other things, and um, and we need to capture their attention and get them to do get absolutely. them where they need to be. Absolutely, so. recognize there, the payoff. Is there's worth a, it. absolutely. Want them that's, to understand. that's the message. They're given the opportunity, but how do you motivate yeah, them to take advantage and, of that opportunity? And they don't. I, in my house, um, there wasn't an understanding of what that. <laughs> I keep and, and I'm passionate about it for that reason, right? Because the, Boy, the you had the under you have to understand that that next just that next level is really huge amount of scholarship money for these kids and these kids can do it and um and we need to motivate them to do it and it really is i believe it's a motivation issue and we have this we have smartest kids and do have smart kids um and we're going to get them there so we'll be working with them okay and then finally, um, just I want to, I know we've already brought these courses to the board and you've already proved them, but I just really wanted to highlight it as we were talking about this program and really to even circle back because I know at one point in time when we were, 
last had talked about our advanced and dual credit, there was a specific interest in increasing opportunities in our CTE courses. And so this is a really exciting. I said at the time we were working on it and you approved two more of those courses tonight. And um, so for next year alone, these will be, um, we're adding AP Computer Science, which was the first AP course um, connected to technology. And then we're adding dual credit courses with EMT, anatomy and physiology, um, intro to programming, web design and engineering. Those are all new courses directly tied with UMHB along with the entering to engineering fundamentals. Spanish classes will be through UM, UTPB. They, they are online, but they are the only dual credit options we have right now in foreign language. So if you wanted to pick up your um, eight, eight credits, you could do that while in high school. And then the flexibility of the online dual credit to eliminate any scheduling barriers for students. That's our AP dual credit. Do you have any questions? Just a comment that I, I would like some follow up on the percentage of students enrolled in AP courses who take the AP exam historically and a plan of how we're going to monitor that moving forward. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Let's talk about some policy. We have a uh, policy update 107. TASB has provided for us and Angela has provided us some reading material for from review. Thank you for doing that. Yes, you're welcome. Update 107 is... Um, I think there might be one more before the legislative session ends, another small one. Um, really the only thing of note in this update um, are some changes to some local policies that we're going to, actually one of them we know we're going to modify from what TASB has proposed. Um, and another, um, another one that um, will bring changes to the way how we've been doing business is the CDC local that has to do with gifts and solicitations. We had talked about that one, if y'all remember, about six months ago, and the administration had considered um, raising the dollar limits of the amount of donations that were brought before the board. And this TASB proposed um, change is that all of the gifts are, that the board delegates all of the authority to the superintendent, and there's not a dollar limit. So that's one thing we're going to be looking at. And, um, talking about that one to bring that one to your attention. And then um, the other one um, of note is that um, there are two new standards added to the teacher's code of ethics. Um, and one in particular has to do with new federal law um, that prohibits an employee from assisting any other employee in the district from getting a job after they leave the district if there's been reason to believe that they have engaged in misconduct, sexual misconduct with a student. Um, so we're going to be writing some administrative guidelines for that. Um, and then the other one is um, FJ local, is has to do with our um, student fundraising guidelines. And um, we have already recognized some things about the TASB proposed changes that are not really consistent with what we do here locally. So we're going to bring you back a modified version of that policy in April. Um, so a few things in here that are a little bit different. Um, and we will um, bring back those changes in April. And of course, if y'all see anything that y'all have an interest in or have questions about, things we, you'd like us to consider, if you'll uh, forward those to our attention, we'll take a look at them before we come back in April. Just, just for point of clarification uh, for the board, um, the local policy changes begin on page 518. And the chart that Angela's put together for us is on page 538. Um, there's a there's two instruction sheets in this packet, which is really confusing. So the first one only has legal on page 274, but if you'll go back to the end on page 543, it has the complete instruction sheet, and that's actually the one we'll be acting upon, although it's likely to be modified um, even from that. Or we'll, 
what we'll do is have a recommendation. I assume that will be to follow that instruction sheet with the following exceptions. So um, as a reminder, legal policies, we don't have any choice. That's state or local or state or federal law. And we're required to follow where we don't adopt because they're adopted for us local policies we have options on so we encourage you to we certainly need to be aware of those legal policies <coughs> the chart that angela's put together uh, beginning on page 538 is very helpful for understanding those but the policies we really need to focus on are the local policies that begin on page 518 if that makes sense that clarify and then and then the link in the packet doesn't work. So just FY and needs to. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. Uh, issues or concerns for future agenda administrative reports? Jason? None. Leo? Two? Hi. No, sir. Amanda? Jeff? Nope. Nobody has anything. Okay. Um, Items on the agenda would just kind of, uh, there's lots of things going on. A couple of things just to put on your calendar. We're getting calendar invites for various things, but the Meet Belton for Military Families is on April 3rd. Uh, Skills USA is going to state contest uh, the first weekend in April. It's a big deal for our students. We've seen lots of, lots of exciting things happen there before. Our next regular meeting is April 17th. Um, Do we miss anything, Connie? This meeting is adjourned, 8-12. <laughs>